these two days are a coming together of um, of uh, two institutions that I really respect. Uh, consciousness Studies at JFK University and uh, Original Face Video. I think both of these institutions are at the leading edge of a society. They're like pseudopods that reach out to touch what is living truth at that moment in the culture. Later we're going to take questions and dialogue, but I thought for a while anyway I just reflect and I'm I'm risking not out of irresponsibility but out of the feeling that the more spontaneous the moment the more fully we will be here together I'm risking not coming with prepared material I think you have seen in these past two days different stages of growth, not only the disappearance of the growth, <laughs> but uh, different stages of uh, my own journey, uh, my own spiritual journey, which is still very much ongoing and stretches on in an unknown distance in which I've stopped counting. In the old days, I used to have some estimate of when I'd get enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> but that has long gone and I've learned patience and I will actually I'm uh, I wish I had the longing of a uh, a Rumi or a Kabir uh, to be done but I don't I'm a little more like Hanuman in many ways but in this particular way Hanuman is a monkey. I don't know whether all of you know about Hanuman, but Hanuman is my Ishtadev or my, in Hinduism, my, um, that face of God that is my own lineage. And Hanuman is a monkey, which accounts for my somewhat simian qualities. Uh, and Hanuman is a monkey that is, he's really a, He's a, a very high saint in the form of a monkey, and he is serving Ram, who is God, and that's why my name is Ram Das, which means servant of Ram, which is another name for Hanuman. And he serves Ram, and it is a form of um, bhakti, or devotional yoga, in which the relation of the... Um, of the devotee to God is that of servant to master. There are other forms like lover to beloved or a child to father, child to mother, like, like Ramakrishna's relation to Kali, for example. That's very different. That is not a service relationship. But Hanuman lives only to serve Ram. And he serves him incredibly because he is so one-pointed one in his love of God that he gains immense power that he can do almost anything because of the intensity of his devotion. And he, um, the, the drama, which I won't spell out in great detail, uh, involves the fact that Ram's wife Sita has been stolen away by the bad guy, Ravana who's really a good guy in drag, I mean, but that's another story. And um, Hanuman goes looking for Sita, and he takes Ram's ring with him to give to Sita if he finds her. And Sita is living out in the world, like we are, in a way. And she's living in a very worldly place, which is the sort of demon loka in the Ramayana, which is the name of this holy book. 
And Hanuman is really going from God to remind Sita, who in this case is a devotee of Ram, she's not wife and devotee, to remind the devotee who's lost in the world or caught in the world that God has not forgotten her. And he brings the ring as reassurance that that has not happened. And that act of coming out into the world and bringing reassurance that the spirit is still alive and well, if you will, and that you are still connected and you haven't lost it, is such a treasure from Ram's point of view, from God's point of view, that when Hanuman comes back to Ram, Ram embraces him and says, what you've done, there's no way I can repay you. This is God speaking to, to Hanuman. I can never repay you for what you've done. I mean, you are as dear to me as my brother Bharat. And Hanuman is kneeling before Ram. And at this point, Ram leans over to lift Hanuman up, to put him on the seat beside him, with the idea that it's like the merging with God. It's like the union. And Hanuman makes himself into stone and he pushes against God in order to keep that distance so he can stay separate, so he can remain in the relation of a devotee to God rather than merging. Because when you merge, it's all over. The rush, it's the end of it. <laughs> and uh, Hanuman, Ram says, what can I do for you? What do you want, Hanuman? He tries giving him jewels, a beautiful jewel necklace and Hanuman takes them in his teeth and bites them apart and throws them aside and somebody said how can you do that Hanuman throw those jewels aside those are very costly jewels he says they're of no use at all because they don't have Ram's name written on them anywhere see I mean he's so one pointed and one of the other devotees says well Hanuman if, if you think that why don't you throw your body away and at that point Hanuman rips his body open and there on every bone and sinew is written Ram 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 you see and then Hanuman heals his body. I mean, Ram touches his body and it's all healed. And what uh, Ram says, what can I do for you, Hanuman? I'll do anything. And Hanuman says, what I would like is to be always your devotee. I would like always to be present when the Ramayana is recited. And I just like to be eternally your devotee. And that is an interesting, it's remaining in dualism. And it's very interesting that there are stages in the spiritual journey where it feels like such an incredible uphill journey where you'll lose it. Oh, I lost it. I've fallen. I've, I used to know. I used to be high back in the 60s and then I lost it. <laughs> I mean, that's a very common theme. And, uh, and what happened? I mean, I got married and the kids and the insurance and the car payments and I don't know what happened. I lost it. Well, it's absurd. You don't lose it. I mean, where can you go? It just is you got probably a little pseudo high first. You got a little higher than you were, and you have to go back and clean up your act a little bit and get your ground because you don't go into the totality pushing away any part of your life. And if you try to push away your earth or your worldly connections or your grounding, send them around again, Sam. You know, I mean, it doesn't happen that way. You've got to keep going around and around until you're not pushing and pulling. And um, as it gets lighter and as you start to delight, there gets a point where it starts to be very playful. I mean, even the hard parts are playful, which is really strange. And it starts to become um, like dancing or floating, or surfing, or something like that. Life, the stuff of life. Because the balance went from where you're in the world really lost. I want this, I don't want this, I have an opinion about this, I don't like that, give me, don't give me, you did this to me, you, you know, things like that. I don't have enough money, I, my body's decaying, all those things. <laughs> and it's all real. And in the midst of all those screaming trumpets, there might be the tiniest little sound of the flute, the inner, the still small voice within that the Quakers talk about. The little tiny voice that says, uh, that's not all there is. You know, and you say, ah, oh, shut up. You know, you don't realize how tough it is being alive. You know? <laughs> See, and it's at first you just kind of ignore that little voice. It's, 
it's the tiniest little whisper of, of uh, equanimity in the midst of all the Sturm und Drang of what all. And then, uh, over time, that little thread gets stronger and stronger and stronger. The image I uh, often have is that story, you know, I just recently told it in a lecture, um, of the man that's imprisoned in a tower and his wife is trying to get him out and they won't let her in, of course, and so she gets a beetle and ties a silk thread to the beetle and sends the beetle up and the beetle keeps climbing up until it gets to the top of the tower. And then the husband pulls in the silk thread and then she ties a little string to the silk thread and then a rope to the, the string. Finally, he's got a rope and he climbs down and escapes. And in a way, that's a little bit what it's like. At first, there's just this little teeny thread of consciousness. And it only happens now and then. You flicker into awareness that this isn't quite, the worldly trip isn't quite what it's all about. And then through a whole set of circumstances that are a process of evolution of the individual consciousness, that little thread becomes a string and the string becomes a rope. And the percentage of time you get lost in the world starts to diminish. And there's a critical moment when it becomes less than 50%. I mean, as long as it's more than 50, it still seems like you're caught in the world. And then it starts to go down until pretty soon your faith gets strong enough that you are, in essence, a spiritual being who's living in the world, which is what Christ is talking about when he says you are in the world but not of the world. And that becomes such a deep faith in you that you can breathe a sigh of relief. It's like you're home. You, you're beginning to go home now. You, you've turned the corner, and the panic starts to leave you, that terrible panic of I'm going to lose it, and it's going to be terrible. And then it's interesting what happens, because as that you turn that corner and you start to get that stronger faith, it goes faster and faster. The rope gets stronger and stronger, and the reality of the spirit gets greater and greater, and then you start to push against it, because you want to enjoy it for a while, because it's so nice, because you look around and you're so in love with everybody. It's like everywhere you look is your beloved. And that's quite a different thing from, I love you, but I don't really care for you. It's a different level of consciousness you're playing from. And you just look out and it's so loving. And the, it's all so delightful and you're appreciating the kind of, the way of things, the Tao, the harmony of things. And then you get like Hanuman pushing against God. You say, well, not just yet. You know, it's like extending the foreplay. You know, <laughs> some of you may understand that. That's <laughs> an esoteric reference. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that um, that I have sensed more and more is a term that's very, very hard for me to communicate to people, because every time I say it, I feel the kind of resistance to even thinking the term. Um, which is the word perfection. That the way of things is just the way it's supposed to be. And that is a real stinker. I mean, it, and everybody throws up to oneself. I mean, when you say perfection, part of me says, what do you mean perfection? Look at, and look at, and look at, look at nuclear paranoia and misery, look at exploitation, look at, you call that perfect? And it's very delicate to deal with that concept. And um, let's see if I, today I spent the afternoon with a fellow who has AIDS. Now, his body is, we we're talking about how sometimes one sickness after another, they just keep coming one after another, until finally you just kind of cry and sob because you just had enough. I mean, you just, oh, another one, oh, another one, oh, another one, it's just so much. And I was looking at what was causing the suffering in him. 
Now, this is a heavy duty one. And I saw that what was causing the suffering was his attachment to his model of who he was. I mean, if you look at the things you go through, you you grow and you go through puberty and then you have love affairs and they break up and then you have economic this and that and all that stuff. And a lot of the times you can say, well, that's okay, that's part of the process of life. Usually when you're in the midst of them, you don't say that. You say, oh, if it was only different than this, if I only had enough money, if this relationship is only working out, if you always have a model of how you wish it were other than the way it is. And there is a little flip that occurs when you look at things just the way they are without expectation and without model of letting go of expectation and letting go of model. You can have them around, but you don't hold the attachment to them. I mean, for this fellow this afternoon, the existential fact is there he was lying on the bed, sweating, nausea, some bleeding, pain. Models of himself, of who he used to be, pictures on the wall of who he was, not who he is now. Constantly comparing. That comparison is constantly re cre recreating the suffering of the model of who he is. And if you have a model of life as something that has no suffering in it, no unexpected reverses, nothing that you didn't plan for. Look at how much suffering you're in for. You can see it, because life isn't like that. And one of the things that Buddha taught was the continuous quality of change of all form in the universe, of which your body and your life expectancy and your mind and the social situation and the world situation, all of that is changing, constantly changing. So that every time your mind grabs hold of a model of who you are, where you're going, an expectation that it's gonna be a certain way, you're just asking for suffering. Can you hear, is this, I mean, this may be obvious to all of you, but it's, it's a place that I get caught a lot, very subtly. And I was watching today, and I kept saying to this fellow, well, here we are, I mean, be here now, so to speak. And uh, I said, just open, let's open, and open to the sweating. Just allow the sweating to be. Here it is, we're all sweating. Sweating is. And a little bleeding is, and there's some pain and nausea. It's all is, and there's the sound of the refrigerator, and there's my voice, and I'm here, and we're two awarenesses sharing the dilemma of incarnation together. And as we talked, he went from busy being a sweating, nauseous, frightened person to being a completely peaceful, open, present being. And it took about, I'd say, about four minutes. Now, he trusted me. I mean, he had written me a letter, and I answered, and I came. And he trusted me, and so that when I started to guide that meditation, he just went with it right away. I just sat on the bed, and I held him, and I just went through this thing, this meditation with him. Now, I thought, when I leave the room, he's going to grab back again, because he's got the pictures on the walls, he's got all the stuff that's going to reinforce that idea of, if I didn't have this damn sickness, I could, mm, or, mm, or, mm. And my heart goes out to a human being whose mind creates their own suffering. I mean, you say, is the AIDS itself the suffering or is the mind in relation to the AIDS the suffering? Is the fact that I am bald the suffering or is it my mind in relation to my baldness that might create suffering? I mean, when I went, I've told this many times, but when I was going bald, I was busy not going bald. <laughs> I was a person with hair that was obviously losing it. And you know what I did. I got a long strand and I sort of did this thing to it and I stood it with the wind and the wind, I would stand like this. And 
I was busy holding on to a model of who I was a moment before. Just recently, I, um, I had perhaps one of the greatest gifts of my life. I had five months of nursing my stepmother through cancer to her death. And she died in my arms. And she was a tough lady. And she was very independent. And she, she knew she was a woman of spirit, but not in any um, way of... She hadn't thought about it a lot. She just had a deep spiritual essence to her. But she and I didn't always get along too well, but we did pretty well. I mean, I didn't stay around too much, but we did pretty well. And then she got sick. And at first, there was all uh, holding on to who she was. I mean, she controlled the house, and she'd be in bed and very weak, so that I would start to take over the house. So in the kitchen, there were things like that. She had collected these seashells, and she kept them around the sink all the time. And they were always in the way when you did the dishes. So now, as I moved in and started to take over the kitchen, I sort of put the shells a little bit to the side. And she came in in her wheelchair one day. And she got furious because the shells weren't there. Because she felt like she was being deposed. This was her home, right? I mean, you hear the issue. And then I watched as the process went on, and the suffering deepened and the letting go went until pretty soon we started to grow together and we were like becoming lovers. We would lie in the bed holding each other and just talk. We'd talk about death and what it was going to be like after death. And, and we were putting in catheters and being carried to the toilet and making milkshakes and doing all the process until finally that room was like a beautiful ashram. It was one of the most peaceful spaces. I mean, we all loved hanging out in that room. It was just absolutely so gentle. And she had converted, transformed, into being this very soft, present being. She had let go of this mind that grabbed and held so tightly. We just got softer and softer and softer until her death was just a whisper of oh, just letting go at that moment. She sat up, she took three breaths, and she left. And I watched this woman who four months before, I had models of keep your distance, be careful, because she can blow up, she's very volatile. And then watching and seeing how my ability to let go of my models of who she was allowed the process to happen so much faster. my father who I take care of now he's 88 and he when he when we were growing up he was very busy with his own career and he was a, a, a father that protected us and provided for us but he didn't have much time for us and he was a little bit remote and my brothers didn't have much tremendous love for him actually I mean they might have loved him but they really had a hard time they they were feeling they were judging him as having not been a good enough father And somewhere along the way, I just started letting go of models. And he has changed. He's had some minor strokes. He's just like the Buddha now. I mean, he just sits there and smiles all the time. And he's, he's absolutely beautiful. He's totally happy. I've never seen a, a happier being in my life. I mean, he can pass out and vomit. And you look at him and he's smiling. I mean, it's just incredible. I say, does it bother you? The vomit's on? No. And he's sharp as a tack. I mean, he's not lost it. I said to him, you gave $750 to the temple last year. What would you like me to give this year? He said, $350. I mean, this is somebody who's out of it most. And everybody says, too bad about you, Father. He's not there anymore. The hell he isn't there. He's, he's, he's just 88. He doesn't care to play most of the time. That's, I don't blame him, to tell you the truth. He sees through it all by now. <laughs> but what I've now got is this relationship with this totally beautiful present being. And I was talking to a therapist and I said, you know, I don't have much sense of history. So he said, when were we together last? I said, I have no idea when we were together last. He said, was it three or four years? I said, I don't know. I said, you know, this man that I'm with now, who is my father, I don't remember who he was anymore. I mean, it's just, he says, well, do you think that's exactly healthy? 
I mean, you can hear that edge, you know. I mean, are you really dealing with your father properly? But what's happened is we're living in the present moment, not in what was. And people come into the house continually and say, they remember my father as having been, uh, he founded Brandeis University, he was uh, co-founded Einstein Medical School, he was a president of a railroad, I mean, he was a real mover and shaker and had lots of stories and a tremendous rich life. And now it's all gone, he's just here. And everybody says, isn't it too bad? Too bad is a model of who he was. I think who he is is much nicer than who he was. I don't think it's too bad at all. Now, that's pushing the edge a little bit. Can you hear? I mean, I really want to push things a little bit with us. So when I talk about perfection, I'm saying open to just what is. And that fellow today suffers much less when he just allows what is to be for the moment. He can still do his visualizations, he can work to change it, but the holding that discrepancy between what is and what he wishes were is constantly creating suffering for him. And for all of us, continually, continually. Another thing I want to talk about, I'm not going to try to be uh, cohesive. I'd like to just play a little bit tonight and talk about things as they come to my mind. Is this, is this all right, the way I'm doing this? Is that our attachment to our senses, our seeing, our hearing, our smelling, our touching, our t tasting, and to our thinking mind, our thinking. These are the, the vehicles through which we're used to receiving information. And they keep us focused on form all the time on things. And because we live in a world of form or things, we tend to think of ourselves as form and things. And there is a very deep Western predisposition to identify with your thoughts and think you are your thoughts. That who you think you are is who you are. Now, just imagine that you are a large blob and that one tiny bit of that blob is form. And there is another part, a much larger part, that is formless. But how would you know about it? You can't hear it. You can't see it. You can't smell it. You can't taste it. You can't touch it. You can't even think about it because thinking by its nature thinks about something. It takes an object. And what this part of you that has no form is, it's not an object. So how would you know of its existence? And if you can't, if you are totally attached to the fact that the only way you can know about what is, is through your senses and your thinking mind, you decide that that, that part of you that has no form isn't. Now, this is a very, um, this, is a, this is about as deep as mysticism gets, actually. Like when Einstein said, and I've quoted this many times, when he said, I didn't arrive at my understanding of the primary laws of the universe, those understanding of those relationships, through my rational mind. What I understand him to have meant was that he went beyond his thinking mind 
and beyond his sense experiences. And he went into, here's where the words start to fall apart. He went into some way of being with what is. Heinlein talks about it as grokking, where you become one with it. There's no longer subject object. There's no longer thinking about. There's no longer relationship. It is as if I am it. He became E equals MC squared. And then he came back and he articulated it because he was a physicist. In the same way Bach went and became music and then comes back and imperfectly pretty good, but still the constant, what comes to the human ear isn't the divine sound. He articulates the Brandenburg Concerti or whatever. Or Mozart or Da Vinci or Michelangelo or who? Picasso. Like it feels to me very much like we are like the drunk, the image that's very familiar by now to everybody. It's been used so much. The drunk who's looking for the watch under the street light, and everybody says they help him, and then they say, "Well, where'd you lose the watch?" And he's set up in the alley. They say, "Well, why aren't you looking there?" He says, "Because there's more light here." But you don't find the watch. And the thing is, when you keep looking for the deepest truths of your being through your senses and your thinking mind, because that's what you're used to using, you don't find what you're looking for. And you always feel like you're one thought away from where the action is. You always feel slightly cut off from being in the moment, being here fully. Because it is not what here is. I mean, and yet, what's bizarre is we are all functioning with that intuitive, non-conceptual information all the time. But we have no way of noticing that we're doing it. And therefore, we relegate it to irrelevance. Is this too weird or are you hearing what I'm saying? I mean, I am convinced now in those studies that show how many people had mystical experiences. Staggering numbers of people have had mystical experiences, but most of them have treated them as irrelevant or trivial. Or I was out of my mind, or I was drunk, or I didn't know what happened, or I went to the movie and I was confused, or whatever. They have ways of, of denigrating it, of treating it as irrelevant, because they cannot gain conceptual control of it. They can't get control of it with their minds all the time. Now, what is scary is when you recognize that the vast part of yourself is not conceptual and is not knowable by the usual methods of knowing, that in a sense you can be it, but you can't know it. It's like the Tao says, the student learns by daily increments. You learn a little each day. The way is gained by daily loss. Loss upon loss until, ah, the way. You clean away the conceptual structures. You clean them away, you clean them away, you clean them away until... It's like regaining innocence or having innocence. The innocence of being just with what is, without the conceptual overlay, without the control that comes from knowing you know. I mean, look at how wedded we are to science as a religion which says what we, what we want to do is build a body of knowledge so we know we know. But what happens if the major stuff of which our happiness and ultimate survival and existence, if that is rooted in something that you can't know you know, what are we going to do? What if it is not amenable to the scientific method? What are we going to do then? Should we reject it? Or is it possible for us to become, to train ourselves, to discipline ourselves, to go beyond our own mind, our own thinking mind, to go beyond our own attachment to our senses and our thinking mind? Is it possible for us, see, 
Western cognitive psychology doesn't deal with this at all, by the way. It talks about what you think about. It assumes an identity between you and the thinker. Cogito ergo sum. But just imagine now, how are you going to get through to that part of yourself which is not knowable by your mind, by your thinking mind, by your analytic intellect? Without putting your intellect down, it's a beautiful servant but a lousy master. And you treat it as a master most of the time in order to sort of control the universe. It's wonderful to be able to think. It's too bad if you can't stop it. It's like the sorcerer's apprentice. It just keeps going on and on and on and on. You can't stop it. When I, after some years of spiritual practice, when I started to not think, my first reaction, having been a, I mean, when I was a professor at Harvard, thinking was the stuff I got paid for. And I remember, I mean, I couldn't waste time not thinking. I remember flying, and I had a little uh, Cessna airplane, and I was flying across the United States, and I had a clipboard on my thigh so I could write down significant thoughts while I was flying, so I wouldn't waste time flying and not thinking all the time, because I could think up research proposals to put into NIH, NIMH. And when I first started to not think, when, when I first would have these moments where I just was, my mind was empty. When I started to think again, the first thought was, uh-oh, I took too many drugs. I think I've blown my brain. There it goes. Too bad. Oh, God. Well, they were right. They were right after all. And I got frightened because ever since I was a child, I was taught thinking is better. Think more, you're better. And your analytic mind can solve all problems. And look what a mess it has created for us. Look what a mess it creates. Because it doesn't recognize the deeper harmony that exists and the deeper unity that exists across peoples and between us and nature, all those levels. It just doesn't do it. It tries to figure it all out. And look what it does. Every act it does to try to heal it, it keeps creating more problems. And at first, when I started not to, to notice I wasn't thinking, I got frightened, as you can see. And then I remember going through the next stage where I thought, well, if that's what's happened, that's what's happened. I've blown my mind. What am I going to not worry about it? I mean, that's the way it is. I'll just be sort of a dull normal from here on in. And I'll just <laughs> be whatever it is that I'm going to be from here on in. <laughs> and then I began to notice that even though my mind was empty, when something was necessary... When I wasn't too frightened to block it and flick a flicker, if I just trusted it, when I needed it, it was there, without my constantly rehearsing it all the time. I mean, you, I used to go down the street, you know, and you'd look and you'd say, there's books, and there's a camera, and there's a, you know, a shoe, and there's a tree, and there's a car. I mean, your mind is constantly doing that. You're constantly reassuring yourself you know that the world is out there the way you think it is. <laughs> And your mind can't stop. It's like this incredible addiction to labeling so you think you know you know where you are in this complete. <laughs> and it's really whistling in the dark. And what's so frightening about dying for many people is that they are going to lose the control of their thinking mind. They can't think their way through that one. And they know that at some point their thinking mind's going to let go. And then what? And that's why in the Eastern traditions, you spend your life learning how to extricate yourself from your thinking mind and from your identification with your senses so that at the moment of death, there isn't that panic of loss of control because you've already died. And when Christ said, lest ye die, ye cannot be born again, we're talking about that. We're talking about dying into who you think you are, the dying of who you think you are, then you are what you are. This is very weird stuff I'm saying. And I mean, if you were just walked in from outside, it would sound like a 
course in psychosis by a, a, a case. <laughs> I remember sp I've told I remember speaking at Einstein Medical School once. The young Turk psychiatrist invited me to speak there. Some years back, and I had a beard, and I was wearing a dress, and I had a lot of beads. <laughs> and um, the grand rounds where I was speaking, it turned out that they alternated days. They had a speaker, and then the next day they'd present a case, and then they'd have a speaker, and they'd present a case. <laughs> so I came in, and <laughs> and I, the only, all the chairs were very narrow, so the only comfortable place for me to sit like this was on the conference table. So I sat on the conference table. <laughs> And I watched these old Viennese psychiatrists come in, you know, psychoanalysts, and I could see they looked at me and they, I could feel they thought, gee, I must have mis, I mean, obviously this is the case, you know. So seeing their predicament, I presented myself as a case. I talked about how he took psychotropic chemicals and had hallucinations, which is the way they'd say it. And uh, they kept nodding until they realized the patient was presenting itself. <laughs> it was sort of the... <laughs> now, just the models of, like, who am I? Who am I? For example, Ramana Maharshi, one of the great Indian saints, teaches something called Vichara Atma, which is the form of what's called neti neti, which means not that, not that. And he says, he helps you. If you've got the discipline of mind, which is a form of what's called jnana yoga, you are able to extricate yourself from identification with each thing. Like... For example, I am not this arm. And then you just see the arm as an object. You don't see it as me. It's just that arm. And so you say, I am not my organs of motion. I am not my organs, my inner organs. And you go through step by step. In each case, you extricate yourself from identification with that. I am not my feelings. I am not, I am not, I am not. You're pulling back and back and back. And the last one is, I am not this thought. Which thought? the thought, I am not this thought, which is the last one you got. See? And that's like climbing up a tree and then out on a branch and then out on a twig and then cutting off the twig, you see. Usually your mind flicks at that point in your back being your body. I mean, it's very hard. It's a tough discipline to do yana yoga. And in a way, when the, the Zen koan, the, where you're confronted with something that your rational mind can't solve, is another way of yana yoga of forcing you to go beyond your thinking mind, to go outside of it. So what is the sound of the one hand clapping or how do you know your Buddha nature through the sound of a cricket or whatever? And you keep trying, your mind keeps wrestling with it, wrestling with it. I mean, I, when I was taking the Rohatsu Dai Sashin, a nine day hell course, um, <laughs> Where you got a five days, five times a day, you go into the, the master. Ah, doctor, how you know your Buddha nature through sound of cricket? And you say anything, you know, whatever. And he, oh, doctor, I am so disappointed in you. I had such hopes for you. You seemed so promising. Ah, so, and he rings your bell and you dismiss and you go crushed back to you. And you got to run back to your sitting mat sit like this and if you wobble they beat you it's, it's really quite intense and I got sick and it was cold and miserable and I hated all of them and I hated me and I was trying to escape and I couldn't think of how to get out of it with safe face and about the fifth day when I was running a fever and I was absolutely miserable I was walking up to the uh, to the interview with another lame thing I'd thought up to say <laughs> and I finally thought screw it I don't really care. <laughs> and I looked around and everything was radiant and beautiful. And I walked in, ah, doctor, how you know your Buddha nature through sound of cricket? Good morning, Roshi. Ah, now you are becoming beginning student of Zen. <laughs> it was the moment of letting go of the mind and just 
Ah, this moment, this moment. Here I am, first time I've seen you today. Good morning. I can't use it the second time. You can't go, in. <laughs> good afternoon, Roshi. See? <laughs> you can only milk it once, but it's... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> You'll forget. <laughs> now, uh, uh, what I've been doing recently is um, doing Vipassana meditation with a Burmese master. I just got back from Hawaii last week where I was sitting for 10 days. And last summer I sat for two months in a in uh, Yekta, in a monastery in Burma, Rangoon. And in that monastery, you figure from 3 in the morning till 11 at night, you are sitting in your cell, following the muscle rising and falling in your abdomen. Every time you breathe in, it, it does something, and you note it rising. Every time you breathe out, you note falling. What you are doing by doing that is you're picking a primary object. You're picking a thing. It's like taking the mind, which is used to having the freedom to go here and grab this and think that and feel this and sense that and touch that and remember this and plan that and all that stuff. And the mind's always going that. And that's what gives you your solidity of your universe. And it's happening so fast, it always seems solid. It's like a movie film in which the frames, all of which are dissociated, but if they go by fast enough, it seems like there's a, there's a real being there doing something. And so we keep re reinforcing everything. I mean, it's just flickering around. There's just so much information all the time, and your, your awareness is just flickering from thing to thing. Because you're only thinking one thing at a time, it turns out. Your awareness is only focused on one thing at a time. But it goes so fast. It goes at the rate, Buddha said it went at the rate of one trillion per blink of an eye. That's pretty fast. Now, that is only fast from the time dimension that your mind is in, it turns out. I mean, this is really playing now with what's called living time. Hold that for a moment, I'll come back to it. So you take a primary object, it's like taking a wild elephant and tying one of those rings around its foot and a, a cable and then putting a stake in the ground and you're going to bring the elephant down you're going to tame it to carry logs or whatever and your mind isn't used to having any controls on it at all and all your rule is you've made an agreement you've come there and you've made a conscious intentional choice that you are going to try to keep your mind fixed on this little muscle going up and down from three in the morning until eleven at night every day for two months seven days a week four hours of sleep two meals one at 5 30 in the morning one at 11 nothing after noon no nothing but water nobody to talk to no books to read no notes to take no place to hide and you're under a vow of truth and each time you go in to report to the teacher you tell how many hours you've been doing it in the past 24 hours. So that if you figure you can go into the bathroom and take an hour off and think about the stock market or think about the international situation or think about your relationships or think about what the hell you're doing here, you can't do it because you're wasting time. You're going to take it out of your sleeping time. Otherwise, you weren't meditating. So you just, it's, you're cornered like a rat. I mean, you just got to do it. And you're doing this voluntarily, you understand. I mean, nobody's doing this to you. It's, it's incredible. And you, I saw how slimy my mind was. I mean, it is so slithery. You try to get it to stay somewhere, and it goes there, and then it goes, boom, and then slithers here and slithers there. And then it begins to think about meditation. That's a good one. That sucks you in. <laughs> yeah. And there are all these ways you watch how creative the mind is in keeping you being somebody doing something. Because if you were only following rising and falling of the breath, where would you be since you're a thought? Finally, there is only the rising and the falling of the breath. That's all there is in the universe. There isn't even you watching your breath rising and falling, which is a thought about it. 
And so you do this for a long time and first your mind stays there and then it goes off and goes off and pretty soon, I mean, years back when I started to do this meditation 12 years ago, I could go off and I could have a six hour fantasy, a six hour sexual fantasy, <laughs> sitting in Burma all by myself in a cell. I mean, and it was just with great detail and the subtleties of the rustle of silk and all the, you know, every little thing and the smells and the images and the shadows. And I just, what was the rush? I wasn't going anywhere. You know, I had <laughs> weeks to meditate and I'd look like I was meditating all the time and they, nobody knew, you know, and I, I would have these six hour things, you know, it was like having an orgy of, or I'd plan when I became famous and, you know, I mean, I'd have those things. When I became like the Buddha, what would I do, you know? And I'd have long fantasies of what I would be, how compassionate I'd be. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> but then, after a while, you see the finiteness of the creation of all this stuff. All of it turns out to be finite, and it's not interesting enough. I mean, the worst thing is to live out how you thought it was going to be. I mean, you look at your life, and the exciting part is that it's always slightly different. It always stretches. It's always better because it's more than you imagined it would be, even at your best imagination. Fantasy isn't nearly as great as what is. Now, I used to read fantasy. I used to read science fiction and, and um, Le Carre and all those kind of things. I mean, I used to read like I was addicted to them. And then I realized that my life was so rich. Why would I go there? And this was so much more, so much more, so much more. So after a number of years, my mind quiets down and it finally gets interested in actually doing this thing of keeping the mind focused. But the mind keeps going off and I feel like I am struggling to keep it focused and I'm angry at the method for entrapping me and then there's some point, this was about uh, two years ago, when after about four weeks of this, I thought, I'm on the wrong side of this game. I'm identifying with the wild mind rather than with the, the point, the one-pointed mind. And something released in me, and I just started to go to the one point and just started to stay there. And I began to feel like that was home. Now, you got to remember, this is all what's known as samadhi of... Uh, in the Buddhist sense, there is uh, shila, panya, and samadhi are the three components. Shila is purifications, samadhi is concentration, and panya is wisdom. And you kind of keep working with these three things. So samadhi is concentration, and you get your mind so it will stay on one point. This is only the beginning. This is the doorway in, by the way. This isn't the thing itself. There's no big deal about keeping the mind in one place, except to do that you have broken the identification with all the other thoughts in order to do that. Okay, Are you with me? I mean, you hear what I'm saying? Now, once the mind becomes laser-like and starts to stay there, all the other thoughts and senses and feelings, they hang around at the periphery. I remember them being like those little bugs around a the light. They just kind of flickering around there. They don't come in and take over because you don't let them do it, but they're just flickering around the edge, and your mind is just staying, rising, falling, rising, falling, rising, falling. And there are stages where you feel peace like you never felt peace before. And I remember going to my teacher, meditation teacher once and saying, oh, thank you, I finally got it. I feel this peace, this incredible peace. Oh, that's what I've always yearned for. Oh, it's so wonderful. And he, sharply attuned as he is to spiritual materialism, <laughs> said to me, how lovely. Now go back and follow the rising and falling of your breath. Okay. Get on with it. Because each time you stop along the way to smell the pretty flower, ooh, bliss, ooh, rapture, ooh, powers, back to the breath. Oh, but I can do so much good with those parts. Back to the breath. And you, you get many choices to step off the trolley, believe me. Well, I think I got enough of this. This is really good. I mean, I really do good with this. 
I mean, the, the difference between where my consciousness is now and where it was a year ago or where it was two years ago as the result of the sadhana I've been doing in the past two years is so dramatically different. I mean, I'm speaking now from a place of such deeper being, my being, than I have spoken from in the past. I can feel it. I know it. I mean, it may sound crazier. I don't know what it sounds like out there, but inside it's feeling really strong. And there's a tendency to say, well, gee, with this, look at what I can do. And there is where the delicacy is, because you've got to balance. Do I get off the trolley here and go do it, or do I put it back in the hopper and run it through the, the blender again? So you come back, and then once the mind gets one-pointed, it becomes like a laser, and it starts to slice into reality. It starts to cut into the universe. And some of the things you see that are stages that they describe... For example, I'll just give you a couple examples because it's such a complex body of knowledge about this. I mean, if the Buddhist Tripitaka, uh, the, the analysis of the way the human mind works is so evolved. I mean, it, to me, it makes Western psychology look like, uh, like Tinker Toys or, you know. Um, you come to a point where for example, when I look at this camera, I see something that's dark and shape and the arms and all of this. I see all this. Now, how do I know that those are arms and camera? It all happens so quickly that when I look, I don't any longer just see shadow, dark, light, form. I see camera and arms on the camera. I already apply the apperception, the conceptual overlay. I do it all so quickly most of the time. And what happens as you get your mind focused in is you get to the point where you begin to see the separate thoughts starting to arise, exist, and pass away. Arise, exist, and pass away. Arise, exist, and pass away. And sometimes you only see the arising of thoughts. You see them all. Everywhere you look, it comes into play. Those of you that have taken drugs may recognize that, that moment where it's what Christ said. And he says, look, I'm making all things new. It's like you're creating the universe. Everywhere you look, you see that you are creating stuff. You're not creating the thing. You are creating the form of it by your mind creating, going out and doing it. And you see the creation everywhere. That's the seeing the beginning of thoughts. Then there's another place where you're just focusing on the middle of thoughts. And it's like nothing ever is going to change. It's all static. Everything's stopped. Everywhere you look, it's stopped. It's like nothing's happening. It's all stopped. And then the third stage is where you see everything dying and decaying and falling away. And everywhere you look, it's decaying and dying, decaying and dying. And it gets, that's what it feels like. Tremendous despair and pain. Now, these are all stages, and they're articulated in the literature, and it's very standard stuff. And the teacher is a person who's been listening to human minds for 35 years and he knows exactly what stage you're at when you walk in and say this happened in my meditation and his he just sees a walking mind i don't know what he sees but i mean that's that's what he's dealing with is a walking mind and he keeps moving you through and buddha describes for example the last 32 mind moments trillion per blink of an eye the last 32 before you go into the nibbonic state, which is the space between two thoughts. Because between two thoughts, there is no universe. It's what's called a void or nibbana. And it's the ground on which all the forms and thoughts rest. It's the sky in which all the clouds are passing. And as you start to deal with that state in your being, you're finally doing what I started out talking about, about recognizing the part of you that is not conceptual. The part of you that is not informed. And look at what a circuitous route, sitting in Burma in the cell, bringing the mind, following the breath, getting the mind down to one point, sharpening it so it becomes like a laser, so it can go through, so it doesn't keep being at the whim of conceptual mind until you can get through and you can go through until you get what's called the vipassana or the insights that follow naturally. 
Because all the things that the Buddha teaches about suffering and the cause of suffering and the end of suffering, the things he teaches about anicca or everything's changing, dukkha, that there is suffering, anatta, there's no self, all that stuff, you can learn theoretically, conceptually by reading philosophy books of Buddhism. Or, but what Buddha says is don't read them, do it. You find out like I found out, because finally you're only free when you've experienced the stuff directly, not when you've just read about it. And I am finally driven to meditation. Not out of, oh my God, I've got to do it, but wow, look at this method and it'll work for me. I can do this. Now, the interesting thing, I, I, I should stop. I just want to say one more little thing here. Um, that my primary method, as those of you that have read Miracle of Love know, the primary, my primary method is my relation to my guru. It's my love of my guru. Now, a lot in the West, that's a really weird thing to say, especially since he's dead. So I've got like an imaginary playmate in the Western image. It's like having a friend that is, is incredibly funny, incredibly wise, incredibly hip, uh, a cosmic player, a rascal, who you hang out with all the time. And he's right here now. He's not here in an astral form sitting on the flowers. I just feel that quality of being in this moment. Now, I used to have him as an old man in a blanket. And after he died, I had the memory of him as an old man in a blanket. And I remember he said this, and then he said that, and then he pulled my beard, and then he did this. And I wrote a book about all the things he did and said when he was an old man in a blanket. But now he isn't an old man in a blanket anymore. He's that too. But he's just this presence. He's this quality of being. And what I found 12 years ago when I used to meditate is that after I huffed and puffed and followed my breath for 10 days or 20 days or 30 days, I'd end up feeling like I was distant from my guru and that my heart was scrunched and dry and I'd want a bhakti hit, I'd want to sing Shri Ram Jai Ram Jai Jai Ram 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 and I just want to go back into the space of my love and my heart and the sweetness and the singing to God and the play and thinking of the little delights when I reach for his foot and he'd pull it back under the blanket and all the little diddly things about relationship. And I'd say, oh, whew, boy, was I dry. And now, 12, 15 years later when I meditate, the quieter I get, the deeper my mind goes, the closer I am to him. Now we meet in the place. Now I'm meeting Shiva. Those of you that understand the Hindu tradition understand what I'm talking about. You meet the formless that's in form. You meet that part of yourself that has nothing to do with who you think you are, what you're sensing, thinking, remembering. It has nothing to do with growing old. It has nothing to do with being born or dying. There's no going. There's no coming. When Hakuin, the Zen poet, says your going and coming is nowhere but where you are, I mean, I get on a plane in Hawaii, Honolulu, and I end up in San Francisco. And then I'll get on a plane in a couple of days, and I'll go to Boston. And then I go on a plane, and I go to Nepal. And I go, where am I going? Plane is flying and flying and flying. It's doing its thing. And I'm right here. And I'm here, and now I'm here, and now I'm here, and now I'm here. If I'm busy defining myself as somebody that's coming and going, it's exhausting. But there is nowhere to go. It's like Ramana Maharshi when he's dying and all his devotees say, don't leave us, don't leave us. He says, don't be silly, where can I go? <laughs> I mean, I'm only dying. It's no big deal. I'm just dropping my body. The minute you recognize that part of your being that isn't in time and space, Swami Ram Tirth says, I am without form, without limit, beyond space, beyond time. I am in everything, everything is in me. Now, that all sounds from a logical, analytic point of view like Absolutely, that guy should be locked up. From a mystical point of view, that's a beautiful expression 
of who we are much more than who we thought we are. So what we're facing here when we come together in consciousness studies and we come together to consider the issues of relationship, of nuclear holocaust, of what we're going to do in the world and all, is that in the terms of keeping our eye on the mark, we do what we must do in the world, but we don't forget that it is all an exercise to awaken out of the illusion created by our own mind, because the more we are free of the illusion, in our own mind, the less we will suck other people into the illusion. And if you really want to end suffering, the way to end suffering is end your own suffering, and the way to end your own suffering is to extricate yourself from the illusion of your own mind, created by your own mind. And once you are free of that, then you have a chance to free another person. When I sit with that person, that fellow this afternoon with AIDS, I am working on myself to keep myself spacious and present and clear and not get caught in the heavy melodrama of a beautiful young man dying. And if I can do that and just see the unfolding of law and keep my heart open and love and be with just what is, I can be an instrument, as happened this afternoon, of the release of his suffering, although for a moment. So that when people said, well, the 70s was the me generation, they don't understand that that was as direct a route to compassionate action as there could be. Because much of the action that was done, and this is my dialogue with Dan Ellsberg, that much of my dialogue, much of the issue about social action is very often, I mean, I don't know whether I said it in that because I wasn't watching all that. I don't quite remember what was edited into the film. But what I said, what I know is that the way in which we dealt with the Vietnam War put Reagan in the White House. Now, Reagan's a good president in certain ways and a horrible president in others. And we don't have to do a political thing. But I can, what I'm saying is there is a pendulum swing that when you do things in a certain attached way, you create the pol you give juice to the whole polarity all the time. And what we have developed is, in this me generation and all these years, is a certain sophistication. I hope that consciousness studies, the work on oneself, to become an instrument for the relief of suffering, so you've got to do it on all levels at once. I'm now chairman of the board of the SAVA Foundation. Yesterday I was at the board meeting. I just finished the board, the week-long board meeting. We just gave away... I don't know, $600,000 for blindness in Nepal and blindness in India and reforestation in Africa and Costa Rica and trades, for crafts for the Guatemalan refugees and uh, health clinics for the American Indians. And it's incredible. I mean, it's just for me to realize that I, like I just went to Nepal as, a, as the chairman of the board of the SEVA Foundation on a fact-finding mission and to inspire the whole thing and to see what's going on and to meet with the, the government officials about getting policies, in fact, in place that would do more cataract operations per year. And I put on my blue blazer and my necktie and I am the chairman of the board. And I think at some point, what am I doing? I mean, you know, a few years ago I was in a dress and here I am in a tie and a jacket going over and how do you do I, and people see me coming as an NGO director I mean the non-governmental organization we have a, a contract with the king of Nepal we're a real we're like the Red Cross or something like that we're a real thing I'm the chairman of the board you know what if the chairman of the board of the Red Cross we're building a hospital in Nepal we've, we've got jeeps and offices and people examining eyes and doctors doing surgery that we're importing from here and there. It's like a big production. And the chairman of the board is coming. You got the image? I mean, if you are a Nepali official, how do you do? And I thought, gee, if, if I can lose the spirit, this is when I'm going to lose it. <laughs> because they're going to take me seriously. And they are not the kind that I can tell, hey, you know, I'm really not the chairman of the board. I'm just appearing to be the chairman of the board. I mean, now that there are no adults here, we can really play. You know, I mean, I, I can't quite say that, you see. 
And I found out I didn't have to. I could just look into their eyes and we could talk about stuff and I could disagree with them. And I just loved them so much that pretty soon it all just turned into, I don't know what. It was like uh, satsang. It was like having darshan of spiritual beings all the time. I came back from that trip higher than I went. And it was a great teaching to me. What I'm trying to learn now, and I'm studying, and I hope to write about it and talk about it and just keep analyzing how to do it, is to enunciate karma yoga much more effectively in our society. That is the yoga of doing what you do and doing it in a way of becoming free. Because when I left Rangoon last summer, I was in a very delicate state of mind. The telegram came, my stepmother had cancer, I had to come home. I came home and I decided to throw myself into service because my guru had said, when I said, how do I get enlightened? He said, feed people. How do I know God serve people? I decided, all right, I'm just going to throw myself in totally to feeding and serving people. Everybody that calls upon me, I'm going to say yes. Till my, I physically don't have any more space. Seven days a week, all the time. My father, AIDS patients, seva, fundraising, therapy cases, working with the aged, we're da, 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 sure. Yes, of course. Oh, yes, let, you write me to write this? Of course. Yes, yes, of course. Till every minute of every day, from the minute I wake up till I go to bed, just more of it. Going to burn out. Why? What burns out? That's the interesting one. Do you have to burn out? Why can't you get juiced from it? If you don't burn out from meditation, why should you burn out from karma yoga? You only burn out when your mind has expectations and models. That's what burns out. If you don't have any model, what's to burn? Only models burn. Far out. So all year I thought, well, I'll see if it'll work. I'm not even going to meditate. I'm not going to contaminate it. I'm going to do it as a pure yoga. By the spring, I was like, <laughs> I can make it through to the next meditation course. I think I'm losing it. What do you mean you want me to do something? Don't you know I'm busy? <laughs> I, I was really losing it, you know. Oh, damn it. I got to go to that meeting. And I went back to, to sit with this teacher just last week or two weeks ago. And I was full of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to face a teacher for whom meditation is the thing in life. I'm one of his students, and I spent a whole year, and I haven't meditated. I mean, you talk about guilt. You know, it's not guilt. It's just figuring how I can cover it, you know. <laughs> see, but you're under a vow of truth, so you can't quite do it, see. So I got to go in, and I figure, oh, boy, I'm back at square one, and I sit down and meditate. Within one day, I am right back where I was at the edge when I left Burma the year before. And I think, gee, it's working. It's beginning to work. It'll work. It's much harder to stay high when you're in the marketplace. But when you really get to a certain point where you, that's, you only want to be free, you use the marketplace to get free. As Kabir says, Kabir or Rumi, Kabir says, I go into the marketplace, but I'm not a purchaser. I don't want to buy anything. You want power, you want sex, you want money. Sure, it's all right to want them, but are you attached to the wanting of them? Are you attached to the getting of them? Therein lies burnout. You do what you do, what happens, happens, no burnout. But that is another topic for another time. Thank you. That's good. I mean, I think I covered a lot of territory thus far. <laughs> you want to stretch for a couple of minutes and then let's do some questions and answers. Is that OK? Discussion? Is that all right, Joseph?
Here we go. Excuse me. One of those announcements, a white Malibu, TKF334, your lights are on. I saw that person come. I'm not sure they're part of this group. I tried to find that person before, and then I decided they weren't part of this group, but I may be wrong. Okay. Are we ready? Here we go. We don't seem to have a Joseph. Hmm? Where is he? Wouldn't you do better at being in the middle somewhere? Maybe, yeah. John, where, John, where should Don be with that? Can he, can people on this side of the house be picked up by him? I'll repeat the questions too. That'll help. Thank you. And should people stand to ask their questions? Yes, so if everybody would stand to ask the questions, that would be really helpful. Okay, this is the part of the evening that is called the answer man, which we make believe you have questions and we make believe I have answers, <laughs> knowing full well that we all know the answers and we all know the questions and we've been asking them in the cave for thousands of years until we're done. Questions? Yes. I, um... One of the issues that I play with, or struggle with, or work with, is the one of, as a psychotherapist, just being with a client in the way that you described, being with the person with AIDS, versus all the theory that I had to learn, mm -hmm. um, which doesn't seem nearly as helpful at times. And I wondered what your thoughts were about the interplay of those two aspects. It's the same. Can you all, did you all hear the question? Yes. Does that get on? Do I have to repeat that or is that all? all right? Okay. Um, it's the same question of what is the relation between the intellect and the intuitive listening heart mind? Uh, the thing called the heart mind, the heart dash mind. Is that um, all the theoretical structure you learn and you feed in? And you feed it in as deeply as you can. And then when you are in the situation, you empty and listen. And to the extent that that stuff is real and valid in the situation, it will, if you trust it, it will arise and guide the way you respond. You won't forget it all. You don't have to keep it in mind. The problem with having a theory is that oftentimes it comes between you and the person. Like somebody walks in and you say schizophrenic. You don't see another being like yourself. You immediately categorize and label in order to be efficient, you think. But in that efficiency, you lose the connection between you and the being. And that quality of heart merging that happens from emptiness is, that's where compassion is that heals. So that you learn the stuff and learn it and then trust that it's in there and walk in empty and then it will arise as it's appropriate. I mean, I learned, I was a psychotherapist and learned all that stuff, and I haven't studied it for 25 years, and it's, of course, changed in some ways and not in others, but I notice that when I sit down with somebody and I listen, what comes out is some kind of amalgam of old psychotherapy and spiritual perspectives, and it all keeps coming out in new forms and new ways, because what is in there is really in there. And I trust it now. I don't have to rehearse it and think about what psychosexual stage of development this person is in or, you know, what kind of ego, weaknesses, and strengths. I don't have to rehearse it because it's there. 
and it will arise. So it all has to do with how ripe you are to learn something and how intu intuitively valid it ultimately is. Is that, it's a very delicate balancing, you know? Questions, yes. I have a problem between this concept of letting go and also being exactly where I am, especially when I'm in a space that I don't like. I'd like you to say something about that, please. What, say a little more what you mean by letting go. Well, when be, choosing to let go of an attachment, for instance, or just being exactly where I am with the attachment. I have okay, to there. Now I'm hearing it. All right. Attachment, letting go of the attachment or... See, the first thing, first stage is honoring what you are. I'm a human, there are attachments, and it hurts. Okay. That's part of, that's the first thing. Uh, opening to what is, not what you wish were. You wish you were attached, but you are. But that's the first stage of it. You can't, it's a funny thing, you can't give up attachments like that. Because as you try to push something away, it sticks to you. It's, you're busy giving up attachment. Like, I'm not going to be attached, which is an attachment. But what happens is you do it obliquely. You honor what is, and then you kind of deepen the understanding of yourself as something else through your study, through your meditations, through your spiritual practices. And then slowly the attachments fall away like the skin of a snake. It falls away. And what you do is you turn and face the attachment and examine it. And you look for that little thread of awareness in you that that isn't attached. It's always there. There's always a little thread that's just noticing the attachment, saying, boy, look how attached I am. That part of it isn't attached. That's just noticing. All the rest of you, 99% is attached. Don't leave me, don't leave me. And 1% is saying, boy, look at that attachment. And you cultivate that little thread. If you try to deny the attachment, that's a defense mechanism. That doesn't work. So don't confuse non-attachment with dissociation or that kind of defense of detachment that's pushing away something. You honor that, that this is part... I mean, I honor that I have desires. The question is, do I identify fully with those desires or not? It doesn't mean I don't have the desires. When somebody's, somebody they love dies, they experience grief. That's a human condition. At the same moment, you can cultivate the equanimity of mind that allows you to have perspective about the grief. It doesn't mean the grief isn't there. There's a monk die, whose son has died, and I mean, I think Stephen Levine uses the example, and, and somebody, I think I, I actually used it in, uh, in How Can I Help? And uh, somebody comes and says, why are you crying? You're such a high, wise monk. And he says, well, everything is illusion, and the death of a child is the greatest illusion. And it's just an illusion, and it hurts. And you don't make believe you're not human. You don't get holy by making believe. <coughs> you allow yourself, you look at it, and then you cultivate that little part of you that is also there. Besides the attachment, there's another part of you that hears me perfectly clearly. Yes? I will repeat the questions, yes. Um, I have uh, really two questions. One is, can an undisciplined person get into the state? And it seems to me you're required to just be consistent in moving along in a certain direction so that if you approach this on a five-minute stage and meditate once every six weeks or go about it as most people do a lot of problems. The question is, um, if you don't have much discipline, can you go uh, proceed spiritually if you're just doing it as a kind of a hit or miss or a now and then kind of operation? There isn't any route through to freedom. You might hear what I'm saying and be so right that in a moment you're way ahead of me. There isn't a rule. You don't have to go through nine steps and everybody has to go through the nine steps. That's nonsense. I mean, there are stories of saints like Ramana Maharshi. He was a 17-year-old kid. He wasn't even a spiritual kid. And suddenly he just had this experience that he was felt he was dying. And he said, okay, I'll die. And he just went into another state and he was free. 
I mean, so that it has to do with your karma. It's not necessarily how much you, how much gung ho meditation you do. I'm merely describing a method. It is not the method. It is a method. Although the people who teach it think it's the method. <laughs> people always do, but it's just a method. Second question. Yeah, are the gurus dying out? <laughs> I hear the question. Oh, it's a very valid question. I... I have a feeling it's a little like the uh, Bhagavad Gita when Krishna says that um, I embody myself from time to time as is needed. And that as long as there is need for such beings, that need will force the, the creation or the bringing down of such beings. And that um, from my understanding of an evolutionary process, there are beings just entering the pool of separate entities and there are beings that are nearly done and they keep coming by. So I think there's going to be a continuous supply. The question of whether or not the culture will support the noticing of them. See, that's the interesting thing. I mean, when you live in the villages I live in in India, they live in the world where there are gurus. I mean, the family I live in has had four different gurus in the course of all of their lifetimes. And they were all like my guru. They were all incredibly high beings. And I look and I'm jealous. But the culture there supported those beings being recognized, honored, realized. Here, if somebody's a guru, I mean, there's, you know, but what do you do for a living? You know, it's just <laughs> not supported. <laughs> yes. Good evening. Good evening. It is. Yes. Um, I'm playing with the idea of no expectations, particularly um, letting go of expectations of the planet being saved. <clears throat> and... To follow along the lines that you've been speaking, when my meditation teacher announces there's one minute left in meditation, it intensifies my mindfulness and my awareness of my breath, of what's present. And I wonder what are your thoughts about what is the breath or the pulse of the planet that I can put my awareness on since I've been told and I believe perhaps that there's one minute, one hour, one year left. Um, I think that right effort, because that question come through all right? Yes. yes. Okay. I think that right effort is very important and that thought is very powerful and that it is certainly possible to affect the universe through thought. And um, Christ said, had ye faith, ye could move mountains. And I think that's true. You can do it with your thought. I mean, I'm talking about literally. I'm not talking figuratively. The question is, how do you cultivate the kind of power of thought that actually changes something? And from my understanding, that thought is cultivated, as I was telling Dan in the videotape, by being so at peace with what is that you are thinking about the peace of the planet and the, the release of paranoia and fear in the culture. But you are doing it from such a quiet, present place that there is not flickeriness in your mind that's created by your own fear about it ending. Or your own... Um, Uh, loss of equanimity into urgency. Into, I got to do something about this. I mean, I think you would, hearing what you're saying, you would meditate in the sense of sending out that kind of thought form to create peace and presence and ration, clarity and consciousness in decision making and surround 
public officials with those kind of thoughts and do all that with your mind. And you would do it because that's what you do, because you have heard what your dharma is, which is a very clear concept about doing what is appropriate for you to do to honor your incarnation. And your incarnation is a member of an ecosphere and a member of a nation state and a member of a uh, world culture and a member of a surviving species. And it all, all those have responsibility in them. And you don't do them out of ought or should or heavy or my God, what may happen. You do it because that's what you do. For years, I thought if, I mean, when my brother says to me, um, gee, uh, aren't you great to be taking care of dad? He's seeing it as some kind of thing that has to be done. I'm not experiencing it from that place. I'm seeing it as that's what I do. Perfectly light, just like I breathe and I take care of dad. And I would make a statement about anti-nuclear consciousness and make a statement about the American Indians at the Four Corners and so on. And I feel just a part of the universe and an appropriateness of response. But it's coming from a very quiet presence. So that my vibration that I'm putting into the universe is feeding exactly the thing I'm trying to bring about. Because to the extent that I act out of fear, I am reinforcing the fear out of which the bomb is being built. No, it's, see, the, you do it because you're doing it. Like I am, this, there's a story of the rabbi who every morning um, came out of his house and he walked across in this little Polish village. He walked across, or Russian village, he walked across the court, the, court, the square, the village square to the shul, to, to Dovin, to prayer. And uh, he'd done that for 20 years. And one morning, you know the story, one morning the Cossacks coming by and he says, good morning, Rabbi, where are you going? And the Rabbi says, God only knows. And the Cossack figures, what kind of a wise guy is this? He shouldn't say that, I'm a Cossack. And he arrests him. And he throws him into prison for being flip. And the wife of the Rabbi comes and says, what did you do? What did you do? He says, I just said, who knows? God only knows. I didn't know I was going to end up in prison. Okay. Yet he was walking to shul, but without expectation, because he walks to shul. And you end up doing, I'm doing what I'm doing now. What happens to you is what happens to you. I'm doing this because this is what I do. And this is appropriate for me to do at this moment. Can you see what I'm saying? And it's appropriate for us to bless and to bring peace and to become, as Sri Aurobindo talks about, conduits of spirit coming to earth. It's, it's appropriate for us to keep purifying and allowing that thing to come through us. What happens is what happens. Is that dealing with the question? In relation to that, uh, there is... Um, the big mountain Sundance, which is, these are critical times for the American Indians, as you know. And on July 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th, there are going to be some prayers and meditation vigils. And all they're asking is that 30 minute prayer and meditation at the time that the uh, sacred tree of life is raised in the center of the arbor, making the beginning of the Sundance. And um, just to help, this is a very critical year, and if you can use your thoughts and your heart to help in the Sundance to try to clarify things a little bit before the, the Indians are taken from their homes, you might do that. I'm going to leave this right here, and if you would like to copy down the times and the hours, feel free to do so. And would you leave it so I can take it with me, because I'd like to remember and do it myself. Okay. Yes, questions? No questions? About anything. You have to be wise. <laughs> we can shift levels. Um, Sir. Uh, is, I'm asking you about cause and effect. And uh, is it a reality? And like you know, you're thinking, well, things are, is it? Do you think about causes? I mean, 
You know, effect, what happens, if something happens, does it come to you, just what caused it? By just being there with it? Well, in the universe, is that question come through, all right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. In the universe of forms, everything is related to everything else in a cause and effect way, yes. That is true of forms. When you get out of form, that all turns into a dream. Now, the question of whether you think about it or not is often a way of getting caught back into your mind to think about why did this happen rather than just allowing to, being with what is. When you, st If you look at the, like Buddha's law of dependent origination, you see that birth is caused by the clinging of mind, and then birth leads to this, and leads to this, and leads to this, and there's about 11 or 12 steps, and it's all a series of cause and effects. The secret of cause and effect in, in our human creating karma is that if I do an act, if I am attached to what I'm doing at this moment, attached to what's going to happen with it, attached to the fruits of it, I start a create a, a condition that I'm going to get caught in later. If I have no attachment to that, as I extricate myself from being identified with what I'm doing, it's just doing, then there is no karma for me in this act. This act is just a, a it's old karma running off without my creating new karma. This is a very fine distinction of whether, if you're identifying with your action, you create more karma. If I think I'm doing something, I create karma and then it is a cause for a subsequent effect. So in a sense, yes, it is all cause and effect from a certain place of looking. If you stand outside of time, it's all simultaneous. And it only seems sequential from where you're standing. You hear that one too? Yeah, exactly. So cause and effect is still a relative term. And as, as is getting interesting in science, as they see the reverse way in which effect becomes cause for the cause which becomes effect. I mean, it starts to go backwards in time. That's what now the leading edge of science plays with. That'll really boggle the mind. Questions? There are many of us here, I know, that are involved in the course of miracles, Garolta. There are various things that are going on that are absolutely uh, <coughs> elevating. And sometimes I wonder if this is uh, something that one should continue on and on in, perhaps repeating and constantly <coughs> reaffirming these things, or whether it is better just to read, to get what you can, and then let go of it and know that it will be a benefit as you live, rather than studying and studying and studying. I hear. That question come through all right? I better get feedback each time. Yes? Um. Oh, all right, thank you. Um. It depends on whether or not that particular form of yoga is your method, your primary method. If it is your method, like I, for example, I was working with the Bhagavad Gita, which is 18 chapters. I studied it for five years, every day. Every day I would read one chapter. When I got to the 18th, I'd start again. Every morning I read a chapter for five years. And I began to feel I was beginning to understand the beginning of it, all right? I mean, it just keeps opening up and opening up and opening up. And so if it is a method for you, you can keep doing it and coming back at deeper levels and deeper levels and deeper levels until you become it, then you're done with it, all right? On the other hand, if it is not your method, you can pick it up, whatever you're ripe to hear, you are, and then you can put it away, maybe come at it some other time. See, then it's not your primary method. But if it's your primary method, just keep staying with it and staying with it and keep staying with it and staying with it. Is that the other way? That's fine. How do you know? (laughs) (laughs) 
I think you learn to trust that intuitive place in you. And for example, sometimes when you're bored, you sense that you're bored because there's a defense in you that you'd like to break through and you'd like to go through the boredom. At other times, the boredom says enough of this. And only you know that. And how do you know? You don't know you know, but there is an intuitive place and you've got to learn to trust that. And that takes some, because there's no external measuring thing. You can say, oh, this is that kind of boredom and this is that kind of boredom. And so you get to trust. And this is very scary stuff because you're in an uncharted realm in which you have a unique upaya. You have your method. It's not anybody else's. And you've got to listen. And for you, this is right on. And for you at another time, I go and sometimes somebody says, would you like to meet? So, oh, I'd love to meet them. And another time they might say, would you like? No, I'm sorry. I really don't. And I trust that. I have learned to trust that more and more. And I'll pick up a book and read a paragraph and put it down. And other books I study and study and underline and write and read. And I have no rational reason for that. I can't give you a reason. I just trust that there's something in me that is homing, a homing device that's picking up what I need to use. And a lot of people accuse me of being a rather sloppy, dilettante, and eclectic. And I, uh, I honor the charge, but that's the, my route. What am I going to do? I can't be a phony about it. That's the way I'm working. Uh, I've got another one to add into the stew of Ramtha and Seth and all, which is Emmanuel. And uh, we now have Emmanuel's book, which I wrote a long preface for. And Emmanuel is an absolutely delightful addition, much lighter than most of the others and kind of playful and just kind of fun. And Emmanuel's book is just, we've been published, we printed, no publisher would print it. So we gathered the money together and we printed it ourselves. And now after three printings, it's just being taken over by Bantam. So it will be, Emmanuel will be everywhere. And another spook comes to light. <laughs> It's great having these friends that don't have bodies because they really lighten your hold of this whole thing of being embodied. But as I warn people, just because somebody doesn't have a body, don't think they're wise. I mean, see, you, you kind of think they're wise because you don't know how to not have a body. But there are more beings that don't have bodies than do have bodies. And there are a lot of Meshuggah beings that don't have bodies. So trust your heart as to whether or not they are wisdom or they're not wisdom. Okay. Questions? Sir. I'm interested in more of your thoughts on karma yoga and particularly how to maintain your center and your awareness in the midst of staff meetings or meeting the king of Nepal or whatever you're doing. More thoughts about karma yoga and how you sort of keep your center through it all. There are there are dozens, it's composed of dozens of little devices, some of which work some of the time and don't work other times. Uh, for example, mantra with certain tasks works beautifully. Like having, uh, doing japa with mala beads sometimes works beautifully. Like when you're driving, sometimes you can do japa. And it just keeps bringing you back, flicking you. You're busy driving and suddenly you're in traffic and then you flick to Ram and then suddenly you're out of it. You go back in, come out, go back in, come out. Uh, singing is another way. I mean, I spend, I do a thing called the Hanuman Chalisa, which is 40 verses in praise of Hanuman. It sounds like I won't do it all, but it's, uh, Shri Guru Charana Saroja Raja Nija Manu Mukuru Sudari Bara No Ragu Bara Bhimala Jasu Jodaya Kufala Chari Budi Hina Tanu Janike Sumaram Pawana Kumara Bala Budi Vidya Dehu Mohin Haru Kale Shukitara Siyawara Ram Chandra Bara Jay Sharana Then it goes on for about five or six minutes. And some days we do 108 of them, which takes about 16 hours. And um, now I do that when I'm driving often. And it'll just keep moving me out all the time while I'm doing it. But I was talking to a fellow yesterday who's a very dear friend who used to be in the temple in India. And he's now a superior court judge in Alaska. <laughs> and he said, when I'm sitting on the bench and listening to a murder case or a rape case, and I've got to be thinking to watch for the little slip of thought all the time, I can't do job. I can't let my mind flick even that much. I've got to stay that conscious in. 
And I said, well, just take a little picture or a little word and put it down on the desk. And every now and then your mind will just float by it and it'll just sort of remember a little bit, just for a second, and then you go back. And you can just do it little bits, little bits, little bits, little bits. Then there are ways of taking exercises, of taking the people you go, like you walk into a meeting. It's the one I talk, the story I tell about um, the state trooper, which I won't tell tonight, but the or the the one about uh, you go into a bank and there's a bank teller and you go up to draw a check now who are you seeing are you seeing a bank tell teller and are you somebody drawing a check or are you seeing the divine mother that's about to dispense is this dorga that's about to give riches to you you know i mean which myth are you going to pump up which is real and you get to so that you practice with people, looking through the veil of the models you had in your mind. And I'm constantly doing that. You sit in a meeting and you look around and you've got all these old models of who everybody is. And then just kind of flick at them. Like sometimes you walk into a meeting and it's a, it is somebody of a, your sexual predispositions as such that you might be attracted to that person. So you meet them and you are aroused. And so you see them as woman or man. Maybe this person is your barber. Now, do you see them as your barber or do you see them as woman or man? Now, if you weren't sexually attracted, you'd see them as barber. But you are sexually attracted, you see them as woman or man. Now, the game is you start to play with that. And you start to play with and that and that and that. If you practice, like if you have a, if you work with another person and you look at the point between their eyes as a meditation and just sit looking at the point between somebody else's eyes, just about this far apart and just sit there looking right at the point between the eyes and just rest on it like a meditation. It's not a social, you're not saying, hello, are you there? I'm here. I love you. I have power over you. You're not using your eyes. <laughs> you're just focusing and meditating. You'll see the face keep changing. It'll start to change after a while and it becomes very liquid whole process and you start to see an ancient being a new being lust incarnate greed fear loneliness you see sadness you see shadows you see youth you see hope you see innocence it, you see almost everybody in the universe all the time and you start to practice loosening the hold of the models of your mind you start to play with stuff it's like turning it all into silly putty but you don't do it in such a way that when they say, well, what do you think about this proposal? You say, what, what, what? You know, I mean, <laughs> see, you got to stay in tight enough so that you don't lose it when you're doing it. But you can play a little bit. Like, it gets so now that when I look at somebody for more than a few seconds, they turn into you wouldn't believe. <laughs> but I don't any longer go, oh, ah, or, or, you know, like that. I mean, I just can look at them. Oh, yes. Hello. How do you do? You know, and it's. It's like shaking hands with a, a crocodile, you know, and okay, fine, great. Now, the other thing is that when you wake up in the morning, often you can just sit for a few minutes and run through your past day and get yourself into a little quiet state and maybe take some holy books you keep around, books that are constantly reminding you that it isn't as it seems, and you read one little shloka or one little paragraph or something like that. You just read it and reflect about the day that's coming up and think about it in those terms. And then go and do the day. And then at the end of the day, you might stay in a few minutes and see how many times you lost it along the way. <laughs> and then you can start to notice what it was that caused you to lose it. And you'll begin to notice patterns that I was doing, like Uspensky describes, he was a student of Gurdjieff, and he describes how he decided to self-remember. He was going to stay very conscious. And he was saying, Uspensky is walking down the street. Uspensky is turning left. Uspensky is walking down the street. Uspensky is hitting his cane on the pavement. And suddenly he saw his tobacco in his shop, and he remembered he needed cigarettes. Two days later, he remembered he had been doing an experiment. Okay. <laughs> It's, oh yeah, I need tobacco, right, okay, good morning, how are you? Yes, 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 and he forgot completely. Two days later, he remembered it. Now, after a while, you begin to see what it is that gets you each time. You're doing fine until, well, let's talk about your salary. And suddenly you go unconscious. Okay? Or lust, or whatever it is that takes you. 
And after a while, you get to notice those things that take you away. And so you start to use your daily life as like a little experimental practice where you're playing with the stuff of life, seeing what puts you to sleep, using little devices to awaken you, to remember, studying. Am I dealing with the question? Yeah. And often you can find somebody else that is willing to play the game with you, if you're lucky, in your workplace. And then you can collaborate and you can say, I'll make a deal with you. I'll help you awaken if you'll help me. And you enter into a contract to remind each other. Now, it's tricky because when you go to sleep, the usual thing is you don't want to be awakened. <laughs> Somebody goes away and says, hey, I, like Stephen Levine and I have that contract. And sometimes I'll call up and Stephen will say, we're in the conversation and he'll call me and we'll be talking. He'll say, how's your heart? Which means... You're losing it, baby. And I'll say, my heart's fine. What do you mean, how's my heart? <laughs> like, you stupid ass, my heart's fine. What are you talking about? Well, how's your heart? You know, and, but I've gotten so that I trust him so much now that when he says, how's your heart? I just kind of, well, wow. I mean, my first thing is, oh, God, he's got me, you know, what's wrong with my heart? And then the next thing is, let me listen. Oh, boy, yeah, I got so busy with efficiency and I got to tell you about, the, you know, so and then I cool down. And you get so that you trust people to help you. But it doesn't mean that they know. They may be stuck and trying to help you out when they can't. And that's why three is better than two. <laughs> I mean, there are things that'll help you wake. And a holy book sometimes helps you, or as we found out in Christian fundamentalism, a holy book can put you to sleep too. <laughs> and a, a spiritual teacher can help you awaken. But often the way you relate to them can be asleep in a kind of hysterical devotional quality. And friends, I mean, all these things can help you or they can be traps. Every method is a trap and every method can help you. And you've got to keep very alert to how you're using methods all the time. Not heavy, just alert. Play with them. Questions? BJ. This is all getting so joyful. I hate to bring it back to the world situation. Bring it back. In your dialogue with Daniel Ellsberg, you touched on the idea that perhaps our leaders are acting out, you know, the hatred and the negativity of all of us, of all of us. And yeah. I'd like you to talk some more about that and, and about what's really going on now. Isn't polarization really happening now more than ever? I was at a meeting with uh, Joanna Macy recently, and when she gives workshops, they do house calls. And these people were talking about how much hatred for Russia and fear of Russian people they discovered. And I saw a um, newspaper today inside a, inside a box where you put a quarter, and I didn't buy it, but I just peeked at what it said, and it said the American Science Foundation had done a survey, and they said 50% of the people in this country had no concept of science at all. They didn't believe in evolution. They didn't know what radiation was. They didn't know what DNA was, da 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 they may be the lucky one. <laughs> so where's, you know, we they? I mean, all of us are into Course in Miracles and Love and Light and Sending Peace and being in, you know, these wonderful gatherings and downlinks and stuff. And, you know, what's we'll happening? Well, BJ, is your assumption somehow is the world is only a useful place for incarnates to do their work if somehow it were all conscious and perfect. But the fact is, it is what it is. And there are beings at every stage of evolution. You may walk down the street and the first person you see is somebody that is very Neanderthal-like. This is the first time they came into a human form of the billions of times humans come. And the next person you meet may be an old saint who just dropped by to bless us. You know, and in between are all the permutations. And the people that end up politicians aren't and necessarily, the criteria for selection doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting the most conscious element. <laughs> and and the, the nature of, what, what, of who we are on earth is that we have certain attachments that are, Buddha calls them the five hindrances of lust, greed, hatred, ill will, agitation, sloth, and torpor and doubt. And um, if you, lust and greed are one, so in case you count and came to six, that's, that's why it's only five. And then there's the 10 fetters and the 22 no, no, I mean, it goes on and on. <laughs> but there are these things that are the qualities of attachments of mind that is what leads to incarnation. 
And when you understand who we are that incarnated, I'm not surprised at all that we are just the way we are. And I don't think that it's very, I mean, I will work, do my best to create heaven on earth. But I'm not upset because earth isn't heaven, because earth is earth and heaven is heaven. And earth, as you become more conscious, you become more an instrument of moving earth towards heaven. And that's part of the perfection of it, is that process going on. At the same moment, there is also the expression of lack of consciousness in all kinds of things. And that's who we are, too. And you will find that there are places, I mean, I've noticed, and I think I said that with Dan, I've noticed, I mean, the fact that I'm going to get into a rental car now and drive into San Francisco on fancy roads over fancy bridges and all that, that's built on the backs of other human beings in some level. I mean, if you go, if you keep following it back, we have been trying to figure out in SEVA how to do ethical investing. Well, you try, it's really tricky business. I mean, how many levels back do you go before there's somebody supporting something in Africa that you don't want to do? And it's far hard to find a company that isn't using some product or have some policy or something, and you've got to really constantly, it's a continuous, those ethical investing firms have to constantly be studying it to find our way through. And we are... We are a collectivity of desires, fears, agitations, all of that. That's part of the predicament of getting lost into separateness. It's built into the system. Now, do you make peace with the system, or do you sit around like the guy with AIDS, being holding on to the model of what non-AIDS is like? Or do you allow for the fact there is AIDS, and then work with what you got to work with, and become an instrument for the getting rid of AIDS, without denying the fact that we are what we are, and it's all right to be what we are. I mean, we are bungling along and muddling along. I mean, I hate to say it to Dan, and I know this is a no-no, and you will be upset with me for saying it, but when that show was done, which was a few years back, Dan said to me in a later dialogue we had when he really got angry at me, I mean, this was nothing compared to the later dialogues that got heavier and heavier. And we did one at Harvard, medical school where I mean he was like this and he said the next six months is going to be critical to the survival of the world well that was two and a half years ago and it wasn't critical in that sense because at some level of collective consciousness the civilization isn't going as as Emmanuel my spook friend said to me when they said is the world gonna end he says don't worry the bell isn't gonna ring so soon school won't be out so quick how presumptuous of humans to think they have the control to end it. I mean, do you think that Reagan's mind is the last word in power in the universe? <laughs> I mean, you know, when I you remember that story, I've told it many times, but when I did Be Here Now, this is a weird story, but when I did Be Here Now, this book Be Here Now that many of you have seen, I think, there were, my guru called me up and he said there, he showed me a number of things in the book which turned out not to be true, which I had thought were true. And, it, and he pointed out they weren't. And he said, and they were on two pages. And he says, now what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, we're about to do the second printing, which was 30,000. And I said, I'll certainly write to them and ask them to change it in the next printing, because he says, fine, you do that. <laughs> do it now. He said, money and truth have nothing to do with one another. He said, when you knew, when you didn't know it was a lie, it was all right. Once you know it's a lie and you keep doing it, then the karma is on you. Do it now. And he threw me out of the temple. He says, go do it now. So I left the temple and I thought, oh my God, I mean, all of our commune isn't worth $10,000 practically, and I'm telling them that we're broke, and I'm going to send them a telegram saying, throw out this $30,000, do not sell them, and print another one. Okay, I mean, the guru tests you, here we go. So I went back up and I sent a cable saying, you know, do not pass go, do not collect two hundred. throw out that, start again, do the, another 30000 these are orders, and I will cover it later, I'll earn the money and pay you back, don't worry, go ahead and do it, because I'm telling you to do it. Because it's Maharaji's book and he wants it done that way. Now I get a letter back from Stephen uh, Jerky saying, I got your cable. Strangest thing happened. 
I got your cable just as a letter arrived from the printer. He had put the job on the press, and when he was putting it on the press, he found that one of the plates for the book was missing. And he went into the file where he had all the originals, and the page for that plate was also missing, which was a picture of Maharaji. And since he didn't know what to do, he pulled the job off the press and was waiting for further instructions. So the entire change cost them the cost of a telephone call, right? Now, who? <laughs> And if you allow the possibility that perhaps is Reagan or who is? I mean, where is the game played from? Is there some guy up in a cave up in the Himalayas sort of flaked out, you know, now and then creating a universe in which we are all busy huffing and puffing? I mean, I don't really know. I'm certainly willing to allow the possibility because I certainly don't think that Reagan is a cause. I think he's an effect. <laughs> I think he thinks he's a cause, but I sure as hell don't experience him that way. I see him as a reactive being with very little consciousness. Not a bad guy. I mean, he doesn't have evil intent. He's just a, a reactive being. And the media are reactive to him, and he's reactive to them, and they're reactive to them. And so that's why it is the collective consciousness that he represents. That's why he gets elected. That's why the media makes such a big deal out of him, because he represents a lot of stuff that we are. And when we aren't, he won't be either. Wow. Interesting. Yes. Um, to save myself from misquoting you from a tape I heard yesterday, what I heard you say was the best or all that we can really do to someone else is our own truth. And you said some people, I heard you say, some people aren't ready to hear our truth. And you said you make some sort of differentiation between those who are ready and those who aren't. And <laughs> probably it's similar down there, but I'd like to hear more about that. Um, you, you examine, you sense what the nature of the license is, what the nature of the contract is with other human being. And there's a difference between putting truth into the words and being truth. And sometimes people aren't asking you, like I work with people that are have terminal illnesses or illnesses that will most likely be terminal. There are many people that have cancer that don't want to know they have cancer. Now, when I walk into a room and I've just been with a doctor and the doctor's told me, and I walk into the room and that person doesn't ask, it is not my job to tell them they have cancer. I will be an environment that will be so available and present that if they say, do I have cancer, I will say yes. But I won't go and say, you know you have cancer. Because I don't really have a moral right to force another person to face the truth unless they ask me to help them face the truth. It's some people awaken when they don't want to awaken. All I think I can do is be an environment for another person where if they want to awaken, I am available. And in human relations, it's interesting because a lot of contracts that seem to be based on truth really aren't. They are based on a conspiracy of you don't shake my ego and I won't shake yours. And they're not really asking for that truth. And what the option to forcing truth is silence. It's not lying, but it's silence. Am I dealing with your question? Are you upset? You want to pursue it? You want something else said? Are you hearing it? I'd like to hear more about also giving the analogy of people walking around with nets. You said it was some comic strip you saw. Yeah. And on their forehead, they yeah. all screw you over for yeah. sure. Yeah. And Just saying, this is who I am, this is who I am, this is who I am. That's where that's where I'm stuck. That's now, where you meet somebody that is busy being somebody, okay? Somebody comes down the street and is busy projecting out their somebodiness. Your consciousness is to allow them to hold on to their somebodyness if they choose. 
But if they are ready to let go of it, there's nothing in you that's going to keep them from doing it. It's where your mind is. If I see that bank teller as only a bank teller, and that bank teller then wants to be somebody that says, say, uh, could you help me with this spiritual, what do, you, what do you mean? You're a bank teller, you know? I mean, if my mind doesn't allow them to be something else, then I am trapping them in their head models. If, on the other hand, somebody comes down because they are also who they think they are, but that's only part of it. All I'm doing is creating an environment where I'm ready. If you want to be only who you think you are, fine. But if you would like to come up for air, I'm out in the street bouncing the ball saying, if you want to come out and play, I'm here. And people are pressing their nose against the window saying, I'd like to, but I can't, really can't. <laughs> My mother won't let me. It's too close to dinner or whatever it is, you know. And I'm just saying, okay, it's all right. Stay in if you want to, but I'm out here. And it's much more that kind of quality of human relationships rather than you must wake up. I was with a fellow last night who has had some intense spiritual awakenings. And he's very locked into an intense energy about these things. And he feels he's got to tell everybody. Therein lies trouble. Why don't you awaken? I mean, that's like kill for Christ. You know, I mean, it's it's that scary thing of that really, uh, you'll do violence to the universe in order to bring truth. And um, you can do that if you are a Christ. He says, I come with a sword. And he turns over the tables in the temple. You can do that if you're fully conscious. Then you're free to play any way you want. But until then, you got to be very conscious of what you're doing. Because you may be doing it out of your own unconsciousness. And you're creating more suffering. You're forcing people to awaken. They're not ready to awaken. Yes? I'm a little unclear about taking on karma. Taking on karma? Yeah. For example, maybe if you, want to, if you see somebody that, that you can maybe help get clear, um, the karma is taken on if you do your acts out of attachment. I mean, if you are a healer, say, that lays on hands, if you are attached to taking that stuff from the person, rather than merely being an instrument that you offer, and if they are to be healed, they will be healed, and if they are not, they're not. But if you think you are healing them, and you are taking it, you'll get it. You want it. But the game is to make yourself just like a sieve and pass stuff through just like Chinese food, you know. <laughs> Eat it and a moment later you're hungry. I mean, it's that kind of thing. It just keeps pouring through you all the time because you're not collecting it. You're not collecting it. But if you are looking, when you are doing therapy or healing or something and you're looking for somebody to say, oh, you really helped me, you got it. There's your karma. You're collecting it. You're collecting. You're attached to the fruits of your actions. There are two rules identification with being the actor and attachment to the fruits of the action. If you break both of those, there's no karma. All right? You don't collect karma from anybody. Those are the two things that come out of the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita. If you are not attached to the fruits of the action and you are not identified with being the actor, like if you're doing therapy, you just hear, and therapy is happening, in which it's happening, and you, whatever's happening is happening, and you're here. And whatever will happen out of it will happen out of it. That one, those two, breaking those two links, then there's no karma in the actions. My, my question gets back to uh, this one over here. <coughs> also, according to that uh, video yesterday, you said that the important thing is not to tell everyone everything, but to be able to tell everyone everything. There's a lot of cases where the person isn't going to come out and ask you, do I have cancer? Here? They don't know what the question is. You, you may feel you have a truth to, to express, but and they may be ready to hear it, but they, they might not ask. I have trouble often distinguishing between thinking the person's not ready and uh, and thinking I am versus um, yeah, I hear not, being, not being ready myself. I hear it. I hear it. Well, I'll tell you, I, I really, uh, this is an interesting, it's, one, it's a, let me work on it. Let me go and see where, where the answer lies.
the relation between people on, is on many levels simultaneously. And on one level, it's what they think they want to know and what you think you have to tell them and what licenses they've given you verbally and what they haven't. But there are other levels of relationship that are very much deep, that are intuitive, in which everybody knows what the game is. We don't trust these most of the time. So we go back into what we think they think and what we think we should do, which is the, in a le way the level of the question we're talking about here. And I am inclined to trust that deeper level of communication that's going on between people. And I know that if I walk into a room and there is a certain space that I am in, it is it creates an environment where if that is something bothering the person, it will surface. And if it is not bothering them, it won't. It's not it'll find its way into form if it is bothering them. I just feel now sometimes let me think about it, because sometimes I'll not think about it. Sometimes <laughs> Um, I will say to a person, we can keep the relationship at this level or we can go towards some deeper truth if you choose. But even that is kind of pushing. What I do, for example, like I do retreats. I'm going to be doing uh, workshops at Omega in New York State and Brighton Bush in Oregon and Lama in New Mexico. And there's maybe a couple of hundred people. And sometimes when I get up the courage, I see people individually, which is a lot when you get 250. But what I'll do, I just did one in Devon, England, and I said to each, I said to the group, I'll do individual interviews. They'll be about six or eight minutes long, which a lot can happen in that time if it's used officially. But I say, I'll give you three choices. And you walk in. Just say I want A, B, or C. A is you come in and we will focus on each other's place between the eye and we will meditate silently together for the six or eight minutes. The B is that you can use me to get to get to clear out stuff in you and get to a deeper trust and openness with another human being. And if you choose B, I will ask you the question, which I mean, many of you have played this game in one form or another. If there is anything you can bring to mind that would be difficult, embarrassing, or uncomfortable to share with another human being, share it. That's like, don't think of rhinoceros. I mean, it immediately forces the most nitty-gritty stuff to the surface. It's called the cleaner of filth in American Indian tradition. The third one is we can hang out. Now, by setting up those three alternatives, I'm not forcing the second one. The second one is the one that will be the fiercest one in which we will come most quickly into, ah, here we are. Oh, my God, I'm not going to tell them that. <gasps> and then you tell them and suddenly you break through and there's this light and you all know what that's like. I mean, it's like primal zap. You know? <laughs> but I'm not going to lay it on them. I'm going to give them that option. And that's the most gentle way. All I did was suggested that possibility existed, but I didn't do it, didn't force the hand. And that's the way I play. I mean, I don't know how else to, say, to answer your question. I think it's a, um, I am inclined not to force people to, if I sense, now I'm trusting my intuition, sometimes I sense that they have given me the license. I don't demand that they say, here's the written contract, notarized, or that they say, I give you license. I will sense where that license is, and so you may sense as long, but you've got to trust whether you're ma wanting to sense it or you're sensing it. And that's where your attachment to whether you share the truth or not is what the issue is. Because the truth waits, as the Tao says, the truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing. If you're longing for that person to know the truth, you'll never know whether there is a contract to tell the truth or not. When you have worked on yourself so that you merely allow the universe to be in which the truth may happen and it may not, and you're listening, you will hear whether or not the contract allows telling the truth. Am I dealing with your question? Okay. Yes. Um, I hold the idea that I want to live my life. Excuse me, you got to start again. Oh, um, I, I hold the idea that I want to live my life in alignment with the will of God. Yes. And I'm wondering if, um, well, if you could speak on that and also if, the idea of affirmations and prosperity 
and all of the kind of creative things that we do, if that's uh, in alignment. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's a lot of talk these days of like creating prosperity and you know, envisioning what you want so you can have it. And I'm wondering if that's in alignment with the will of God or if we should just open, you know, to what it is. I think that as you evolve, more and more you find yourself in the stance of listening listening to hear the way of things, which you could call the will of God or the Tao or the, the evolving form of things or some way in which the next action comes out of your unique capacities and the options and the possibilities and the plan of things. And you're listening to hear the plan, to tune the plan, which is not a rational intellectual plan. It's, it's a deep intuitive plan. And you can't be afraid to make mistakes and go off field and just got to get up and the minute you feel you're offline, you just get up and keep correcting and correcting and correcting and brush yourself off and get on with it and then just keep, because it's the whole course of life is like falling in your face, getting up, taking a step, falling in your face, getting up, taking a step, falling in your face. Because you're constantly going to feel the way it is at the moment and then your mind will think where you think you're going with that and then you're back in your thoughts again and then it takes you off. It takes you a little oblique because you're already projecting into the universe rather than listening. You go from listening to projecting to listening to projecting until pretty soon the action's coming out of listening without that intervening thing of models and projections of mind. All right? Is that now? Um, there are times when you can hear how things are and you see that they could all be different and there are all kinds of possibilities and there's no reason why you can't all open to things being different than they are. The You can work to be economically successful through right livelihood and do very well without being attached to whether or not you do well or not. That's a quite a delicate art form. And that's the one right there. It's the attachment to the outcome that's where you're going to trip up. If you are busy being miserable because you don't have the money, it's already got you. I don't have the money, that is the way it is. Also, I could get the money, that is the way it is. I'll work to get the money. If I get the money, I'll get the money. If I don't get the money, I'm still here. That's different. See, there are ways of using it without... It's not using your powers in op opposition to the way of things. You are allowing, like, I'm very good at speaking, obviously. You can see you are sitting here. <laughs> you know, I mean, and I'm doing, I'm using a power now. But I'm really very, very much attached to it. And I'm doing it. And what happens then, if you didn't sit here, I wouldn't be speaking. And that's the way of it. Then I'd be selling shoes or whatever else I'd be doing. I mean, I don't feel it's a mission or a myth or anything. I'm just listening. If this is the way of things, this will be the way of things. Tomorrow I find I have AIDS or cancer or something. Okay, that's a new thing to deal with. Ah, so. Ah, so. Ah, so. Ah, so. So. It doesn't mean in any way you can't use your mind and your will to change things, to bring about peace, to bring about prosperity, to bring about happiness, to bring about good health, to bring about all these things. But your attachment to whether or not those things happen is where the trap is. Saying, if you don't do it, God, screw you. Or uh, it's, it's the issue of Job. It's really Job's relation to God. It's, it's, we're, we're, re, we're rethinking now at this moment. Yes. Uh, on the tape yesterday, you described relationships as two people becoming one awareness and then going back into two individual entities. Would you expand on that explanation, please? Um, if you and I come together and meet as separate entities, and then as I was talking about in the karma yoga thing, we start to go closer, and I see that you are woman and I am man, you are also Western and I am Western. 
You are also perhaps cook and I am eater. You are also, I have a car and you're a rider. I mean, we can go through role after role after role. After a while, after we've met in dozens and dozens of role relationships, we start to realize that in us which is common to all of them or behind them. And it is a place in which both of us are aware of our different roles with each other. I'm the one that does the salad, and you're the one that does the, you know, the main course. I'm the one that changes the diapers, and you're the, it's all on like that. And we start to meet in a space where there is one awareness, but there's two bodies moving in and out of different roles. And that shared awareness, keeps if you keep cultivating it, it becomes a recognized third component in the relationship. And it happens in people that have been together for years. They begin to say, I know what you're thinking all the time. I mean, you got to know another person so well. But if you start to see it as a triangle, you see you're cultivating a place where we are both seeing the universe roughly from the same place. It's not a space or time locus, because in space or time, you're separate from me. But in our awarenesses, there's a place where our awarenesses are not separate. And that's the place we have to cultivate and acknowledge. That's the thing about that big part of us that doesn't have any form, because that doesn't, that's not in form. There's no place where we are one. There is a non-place where we are one, but not a place where we are one. And as we acknowledge the non-place, that starts to get richer and richer and more real and solid in our awareness. And then we start to go out into the two, and we start to play with the two from the one. And then we are at play in the two. Like I work with staffs, we just went through a board meeting in which there is a tremendous shared awareness of our, we have these kind of confrontational first few days of the board meeting where we clean out all the crap that's between us and the lack of truths and the, all that stuff. And once it's there, there's a shared awareness we share and then we all play our different parts in the dance. And we're delighting in the one of us being the many-handed hydra, you know, that's doing all this stuff. Some of us are in Nepal, some in India, some in here and there, and we're all doing different things. But there's a shared awareness, values, consciousness that's rooting it. And you, you got to cultivate that constantly. Is that dealing with the question? Yes. Um, in one of the tapes um, yesterday, you mentioned something about somebody who was close to you that was suffering a kind of illness. And you said something, or a way of that person, how that person um, deal with the illness. You know, I couldn't get it very much. That person, I think, was your father. In the mm. shingles, yeah. I in what? Shingles. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. How did uh, you deal with the illness? Well, if the other person is busy being ill, the first thing is you, if they are suffering, you do what you can to relieve the suffering. I mean, I called around and I found out what all the possible cures were for it. And I found out that Laura Huxley had the same thing, and I called her and asked her what treatment she used, and I got the different medicines, and we tried this and tried that. I mean, you do that at that level. The other part is that you cultivate in yourself this quietness of mind that says, this is all the stuff of life, and this is the way this is at this moment. So you allow the to speak. At the same moment, you're doing the best you can to get rid of it because the person wants to get rid of it. But you are not busy being caught in, I've got to get rid of this illness. It's the same thing. I'm talking about the same thing, about attachment to the end of it. So that you are helping the person, but yet allowing whatever happens to happen. I don't know whether he's supposed to have shingles because maybe the shingles are awakening in him. How presumptuous of me to think that he is not supposed to have shingles. If he doesn't want shingles, I'll do my best to help get rid of them. But whether they go or not, that is not in my hands. All right? And that's the one about the attachment to you love other people and you don't want them to suffer. And that's an interesting one because in a way that's a little presumptuous. 
you got to watch that. It's a very delicate one about the attachment to loved ones. And it's not something you should get uptight about. It's our human condition. But you just stay open to it. Sorry, I'm not answering that fully, but I don't really think I can get hold of it better than that tonight. Any other question? Yes. Uh, if a nuclear holocaust did occur, and this planet would no longer support human life, what happens to all the karma? Or in other words, how necessary is the human form to do the work? I feel that as long as there is need for some plane of existence, because there are beings who need that plane, they create it. I mean, I think this plane is the crea collective creation of the attachments of the, uh, the entities that make it real, which includes animals and plants and humans and all of it. And that if those consciousnesses didn't project it in outward, it wouldn't be. And as long as those consciousnesses needed, it will be. It will be there. I mean, I don't question that we create just exactly what we need to get on with what we're doing, which is in a, in a spiritual evolutionary sense. So to think that this is the only place this earth can be or consciousness can exist or forms can take this particular type of density and work with these particular kinds of desires, I don't know that to be the case. I mean, we don't know. We keep asking, is there life on other galaxies or whatever? We may get a chance to find out in later incarnation. Oh, what do you know? I didn't, I didn't expect that. <laughs> Francis, you're on a question, but in thinking about this idea of uh, the non-place where we are all on, uh, collective consciousness and that sort of thing. I believe in that. I occasionally catch glimpses of it. I definitely don't live there. But uh, it seems to create a problem, particularly in the area of sexual relationships. And on one hand, I want to strive for that uh, unity. But the more I capture that, the less it seems appropriate uh, have exclusive relations. And that's thing to do, and even within me, it seems appropriate. I hear where you're going. <laughs> yeah. As you connect more deeply to the place inside yourself where um, you are in the place of consciousness or awareness or love or presence and you rest in that more and more do the, you look at people and sort of be in love with them all the time and since most of us in this culture have arisen in our socialization process out of a conditional love environment, we have always, most of us have come away with a feeling of needing love, a feeling of deprivation. So we're working out of a deprivation model so that when we feel that love, we want to collect it and possess it and hold it. And so we say, won't you come and, you know, nest with me. The predicament is that as you start to rest in that place of love, and it's not just turned on by some other being, which is in instinct theory called an innate releasing mechanism, that releases that thing in you, but you're starting to rest in it. As you rest in it, then everybody you start to be in love with. Then the question is, who do you sleep with and who do you don't? I mean, that's the question that's coming down to. And <clears throat> there's where the listening is very important, because... <laughs> You begin, I mean, I can be sexually turned on by almost anybody in the society at this point now. I mean, it all seems like a huge sexual dance to me. It's all a huge dance of love and intimacy and awakening and a love. I don't sleep with everybody. And I listen to hear the appropriateness of what business I have with another human being. And sometimes... If you're attached to collecting, because you're still working out of the deprivation model, it gets complicated because the attachments of your mind say, ooh, there's more, I want that. Ooh, I want that. Ooh, I want that one too. 
But if there is not that attachment, because you've let go of the deprivation model, because you're starting to recognize your new state of being, that you are living in grace, or you are living as the beloved, or in the world of the beloved, then you start to quiet down after a little while, and you listen, and you hear the total social structure, the civilization, the possibilities, the cost, the energy, the efficiency, the human needs, the personality structure, and sometimes you can look at somebody and love them incredibly and be turned on by them, but there's nothing you have to do about it. And it's very weird at first. It's very weird because you are so turned on that you usually, if you were only a member of the species producing, that would suck you in at that point. But as you start a rest in consciousness and that quality of love, you that's the resting in the divinity in you. That is not just your species identity. And then you don't have to act in a reactive, instinctive, compulsive way any longer, because that's only a part of you that acknowledges there is that desire and it could happen. But as you listen in the totality of all of it, it doesn't happen. Like at this moment, I could stand up and take all my clothes off and go to sleep. I could do it, but it doesn't feel right. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's the level of it. It just isn't intuitively in the cards. It's not the way of things. I was giving a lecture once in Los Angeles, and I remember uh, it was back in those days, and uh, these people came up on stage as they rip off their clothes and said, okay, Ramda, Dick, this is the time. Take off your clothes. This is it. And I looked out at the audience, and I said, I don't think it's the time. I mean, it just doesn't feel appropriate at this moment. And they said, oh, you're all tight ass, and it's your problem, you know. Well, maybe, but it didn't feel intuitively right at that moment. And it's the same thing. You end up feeling appropriateness. And it isn't necessarily the appropriateness the culture says is appropriate. It's appropriate you feel the rightness of. I mean, I was, I've had experiences where, where I'm helping somebody in the final moments of their life, and we are making love. And they die in the mode of us being in love with each other in the deepest sense of kiss and hug and hold and tender touching. And I think, how am I going to put that in the journals? You know, how do you write that, write about that for the culture? Boy, oh boy. Ooh, what is he, some kind of necrophiliac? I mean, it's horrible. He makes love with dying people. But it intuitively feels right at that moment. I don't set it up as a rule. Well, now for dying 203, we will all make love. Because you can't, you don't do it that way. You've got to keep listening and listening and tuning and not being afraid to trust that intuitive sense. It may be very complicated politically and economically. I'm not saying there's a rule that you can hide behind. That's the thing. But you've got to examine how much your deprivation model about love and your unconscious identification with your instincts is ruling the roost and slowly bringing it up into awareness where you can hear it all and out of that will come appropriate action. There's the lady behind you. I have something about obstacles and non-resistance in the expression of our Dharma. And kind of tying in with what he said earlier, when you find something that feels like a way or a path for you, and it seems you meet resistance or obstacles, your own experience about the meditation and the form of meditation you chose, when, is that the same old thing about the inner listening, about when do I go past it, and when is it somebody saying turn right or turn left? I don't know if I'm making myself clear to you. Try a little more on mine. Well, in the expression of our way, yeah. if we meet obstacles, if yeah. we meet resistance, I'm sometimes confused about whether the message is to I go understand. Through. Okay, now I got it. Okay. And the answer is, uh, there is no rule. Sometimes... I meet a resistance, like uh, I don't want to go to one of those meditation courses where I'm going to be beaten, but I want what I, the, I want the effect so much that I will go through that. I'm not a masochist, but I will go through that because I want it, and I will, go, I will override my resistance joyfully. And there are other times where the resistance says, hey, not now, that's not the route, and I trust that. And I don't know why I do it. 
And more and more I'm trusting that intuitive, non-rational, where I'm not explaining to others why I do what I do. I read through letters. One, I pick up the phone and call, and another, I just leave, and it doesn't get answered for months. And I can't tell you why I do that. It's not they're the sickest or the this or the that. And sometimes when I examine it, it came out of my desire systems. And sometimes it came out of some higher thing where the person I call and they say, isn't it funny you just called now I was about to commit suicide or whatever, you know. And I really have given up even, even thinking about why I do that. I think you can trust yourself more than most of us do. Most of us do. Uh, what, what do you do with the thoughts, this is a big question, what do you do with the thoughts that invade your mind of a negative quality? Uh, I'm going on a trip. Oh, that bus just went over the thing. Uh, maybe my my vehicle will go over the thing. Uh, you're not worth anything. You're going to do this. The type of thing which you know is against <clears throat> your nature and your principles and all of that is, you could say, it was kind of like the devil talking to you. But how do you keep these things out? How do you control them? Um, one of my teachers said to me, I'm talking now from a spiritual level, not a psychodynamic level. My teacher said, one of my teachers said to me, their old karma running off, don't make such a big deal. There's stuff coming out of the past, out of past births or the past of this birth. And when they come up, if they don't free you, let them go right away. The minute you notice them, okay, there's another one of those, bye. Hello, see you around. Don't feed them. The feed and caring of anger or judgment is an interesting thing of to, to learn how not to feed and cultivate anger and judgment. You know, because you're constantly judging, because you're feeling unworthy and inadequate, so you're constantly judging everybody as better or worse, or bigger or littler or something, more successful, or less successful. And you see the judging mind keeps separating you from the universe, and it's not going to liberate you. And so finally, when you notice yourself, you just say, ah, there's judging, and then you just go back into the, into the present. My guru once said to me, I mean, this was the way he taught me that. He said, Ram Dass, tell the truth. And he'd call me up from the back room, and I, they'd say, Ram Dass, Maharaji wants you. And I'd go running up, and I'd sit down, and I'd expect the greatest teachings in the world. He'd say, Ram Dass, yes, Maharaji, tell the truth. Yes, Maharaji, ja, go. So I'd go back, and a few minutes later, they'd say, Maharaji wants to see you, and I'd run up, and I'd sit down. Randas, yes, tell the truth. Yes, Maharaji, Jow. I mean, it's really like you think you're in a, uh, you know. I mean, that's what a lot of it is, you know. It's not all, let me tell you, child, the greatest truth of the universe. It's all this kind of Mickey Mouse stuff going on. And so he's saying, tell the truth, tell the truth, tell the truth, until finally I think, okay, he wants me to tell the truth. I'm getting the message. So then he starts, once I start to feel the message, he starts the thing of Ram Dass, love everyone. So I get that about 40 times. So I start to realize that the truth is I don't love everyone. So which one am I going to do? And he's giving me conflicting messages. I decide that I'm... I've been trying to love everyone, but it's been a little hypocritical. And the truth is I don't. So why don't I try telling the truth for a while? The truth is, when I look at most of the people I'm around, I don't like them at all. So I started to just realize I didn't like everybody. I was with 35 people. They were with Westerners around Maharaji, and I really ended up, I detested all of them. <laughs> For righteous reasons. I mean, really good reasons. <laughs> so finally, I was so angry at everybody. It was bizarre. I mean, I really, something happened. I just got more and more angry. It was over a period of two weeks. I don't know whether there was somebody's hand in it, but I mean, I was getting more angry. And I wasn't touching money in those days. I mean, it was phony. I was doing that too. I had a bag man that carried my money for me. <laughs> but I was so mad at him and everybody that I had to walk. I wouldn't even allow them to carry my money. So I had to walk eight miles to the temple every day. And they all got in the bus and rode there. And so when I got there, they were eating and they'd been with Maharaji and I was pissed off. And I came in and this guy brought some food to me that they'd been saving for me. And I picked it up and threw it in his face. I mean, I was really angry, as you can imagine. And Maharaji was sitting across the courtyard. Ram Dass, 
<laughs> so I went over and he said, something troubling you? <laughs> and I said, yes. I said, I hate all those people. I said, I can't stand them. I can't stand their impurities. I can't stand my own impurities. In fact, I don't like anybody but you. He says, you love me? I said, yeah, I love you. And I started to sob. And he sent for milk and he was pouring milk down me and hitting me on the head and pulling my beard. <laughs> and after I quieted down, he leaned forward and he said, I told you to love everyone. I said, yeah, but you told me to tell the truth. And the truth is that I don't love everyone. And he says, tell the truth and love everyone. <laughs> Now, what do you do at that point, you see? I mean, what I saw was that when I finished being who I think I am, who is somebody who doesn't love everyone, and that's my truth, where's that from? He's telling me who I'll be when I get finished being who I think I am, right? And all I saw was he was saying, let it go, let it go. And so I went across and I cut an apple into many sections, or many apples, and I went around to each person, and I fed them a piece of apple. But you, you know in Hinduism that if you feed somebody with anger in your heart, it's poison. And I didn't want to poison them. I just didn't like them. So I would, I would hold the apple and I would work until I could let go of the anger. And I really, because I was right in every case, you understand. So it wasn't easy to let go of that anger. I mean, you know how hard it is when you're right. But I realized that he had said what to do when I wanted to get free. I didn't want to be, you, you have a choice if you want to be free or right. See? And I wanted to be free. And finally, I could put the apple, it took me about an hour and a half to put the apple into everybody's mouth. And he was watching the whole thing. And about two weeks later, he did some outrageous thing and I got angry at him. And I was sitting there steaming and he said, he opens his mouth, he says, got a piece of apple? <laughs> And we started a process where now I realize my anger isn't going to get me to God and I want to be free. So I just let go of my anger. Now, from a psychodynamic point of view, I don't work it through. I don't cathart it. I don't express it. I just let it go. And we all know psychologically that's a really bad thing to do, but that's what I do. And it's working. I am a much less angry human being than I was five years ago. Damn it. <laughs> It's 11 o'clock. I think we should. Uh, yes. Right. Uh, Ron Doss, it, it feels right the way you are with the dying, people in grief and pain. It feels right to care about everybody, and it feels right to care for everybody. I find myself in a dilemma, and sitting here listening to, all, to everyone talking, I was trying to think how I was going to formulate this without, um, I just don't know how to formulate the question, so I'm just going to put this out. Uh, being in the fire department, I deal with stabbing, shootings, overdoses, violence all the time. Yeah. So I went through a period of going to meditation, sitting, enlightenment intensives, uh, read books, pretend you're light, look yeah. for the spirit up in the corner. Yeah. Um, all the ways. All the different ways. Okay. And I just find myself in a situation of just being numb, becoming numb over a 12-year period of going to stabbing, shootings, heart attacks, people resisting dying. Most of the situations I come into, people are resisting. You know, they don't want to leave. Yep. And they're holding on. They have their oxygen. They have their pills. Yep. Everything you can think yep. of is around them. Yep. Yep. Ambulance comes in. Where's the medications? Yep. Who's the doctor? Da, 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 da. So it's, I've got into the pattern of turning on, shutting off, turning yep. on, shutting off. Mm -hmm. If it's a little kid, I feel more. Yeah. I feel more. I understand. Uh, where it's a growing up, it's like that's the way it is. If that someone's is, been stabbed, I hear. But there are two ways. I hear your whole point, right? Uh, there are two ways of the statement, that's the way it is. One is, that's the way it is where you've turned off your heart in a sort of cynical way. Well, that's the way it is. And the other is where your heart's wide open, and that's the way it is. And you're right there with the person, allowing them to resist dying if that's what they need to do. But you are there with a peaceful presence that allows them 
to find peace through your being if they're ready to do that at that last moment. And that's what you can offer them. And it's just like Mother Teresa saying that the people in the gutter, the lepers that she's taking care of, are Christ in all his distressing disguises. Each one of those beings is an exercise for you in compassionate consciousness. You can do as much as you can handle. The way you handle it, because the choices aren't just coming into your human heart where it hurts like hell or turning off. That's what usually the culture does. That's what, I do, I do a whole chapter about that about in here, about that professional warmth that people get into, where they turn it down because it's too painful to deal with all the pain, the suffering, and the resistance all the time. So you just sort of go numb as you're talking about it. The other way is to cultivate an awareness that allows you to be in a situation, your heart is open and it hurts, and at the same moment there is equanimity that you've cultivated through all that stuff you've done that says, maybe it is right this person's going to die, I don't know. I will do what I can because I am an instrument of life to keep them alive. Whether they die is in the hands of God, it's not my hands. And I will be with them in such a way that if they are ready to let go, I'll be there for them. And if they're not, they're not. And so you're using it as an exercise to cultivate your higher consciousness through the process of doing it each time. And every time you get to it, the reason you close your heart is because you see that the option to it is the pain of the human heart. And what we're trying to do is cultivate the balance between the human heart, which hurts like hell with other suffering, and the expression, my heart goes out to you. And we're overwhelmed because my heart's going out here and then there's suffering here and my heart goes out here and there's suffering here and my heart goes out there and pretty soon you can't stand it anymore, especially if you're in a business like yours where there's just so much suffering you're facing all the time. But as you cultivate that higher awareness that looks at things and says things, there is law, there is meaning to suffering, death occurs when it is supposed to, it is just happening as it needs to, some people will suffer, that's their process. And Part of the perfection is me being an instrument to help end the suffering if I can. You see all that the way it is. If you just stay up there, as I talk about in my lectures, and somebody falls down in front of you, you say, karma. Which is a very cold thing. Because that's a very impersonal cold place. If you're just down in your human heart, you can't bear it, so you turn off. And you become cynical or numb or whatever you become. The game is to balance that higher wisdom with the open human heart. There's a beautiful statue of the Buddha that has a little smile at the end, at the edge, and it's known as the smile of unbearable compassion. You're looking out at how it all is. Your heart is wide open. It's ripped you to shreds so much already. I mean, if you think a child dying is hard, that you realize that for saint, everybody is their child. So there are all, all the people in the world, the billions of the world, and how many are dying every second. They're all, just because you're not seeing them doesn't mean they're not suffering and dying. And your heart is just so open, it's just open. But with it all is this absolute equanimity of it is, it is, it is. And that, oh, quality. That what's called the living dead. It's the, oh. And the heart's open and the, oh. And you put those two together, there's compassion. There's compassion. So you keep cultivating. Sometimes you get so high, but your heart closes. Sometimes your heart gets so open, but you forget your higher wisdom. You keep cultivating until you get that balance just right. Just right. That's a good way to end. But I think it would be nice for us maybe just to... We've been talking about listen. And there's a nice song that you probably know called Listen, Listen, Listen. Just very gently and quietly, let's just play with it. It's listen, listen, listen. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. I will never forget you. I will never forsake you. I will never forget you. I will never forsake Now, wait a second. The you is many levels of you. The you can be, I won't forget you, or I won't forget the highest being that's in within me. You meaning our highest self, or the spirit, or God. It's a way of remembering. And you can play with it, all the different ways of I will never forget you. Or 
maybe the singer is the higher part of you that's not forgetting the part of you that's caught. Okay, it goes the other way. Just play with it. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. I will never forget you. I will never forsake you. I will never forget you. I will never forsake you. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. I will never forget you, I will never forsake you, I will never forget you, I will never forsake you. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. I will never forget you, I will never forsake you, I will never forget you, I will never forsake you. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. I will never forget you, I will never forsake you, I will never forget you, I will never forsake you. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. I will never forget you, I will never forsake you, I will never forget you, I will never forsake you. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. I will never forget you, I will never forsake you, I will never forget you, I will never forsake you. silence we know. It's been a beautiful evening. Thank you so much. Namaste. Namaste.